I'd like very much at this time to introduce our education co-chairs, Mr. Tom Wilson and Mr. Robin Shelton. Tom. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, before we get started with the meeting, if we do an all stand and uh, we'll send you a pledge of allegiance to uh, face the flag. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag. flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, the indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. As Jeff tried to say, this is the annual Golf Industry Business Summit. And it's an opportunity for each one of you to learn something at the same time, uh, basically, Get your requirements in for the MSR, uh, which I'm sure most of you are here today because uh, we only have about 22% of our membership here in Southern California who have actually met their MSR requirements so far. So you have until next June 15th, 2015, to uh, get 36 hours of education in, credits in, and then another 18 of meeting and service credits in. So. Uh, you should have received a little handout when you went through uh, this morning that gives you a little bit more information on what your uh, MSR requirements are and a lot of good ideas on how to meet those requirements. You don't have to do it all by these kind of education seminars, although we're going to provide several of those for you. Uh, but there's other ways for you to do it. There's other online education things that you can do. You can get some college credits. Uh, you can do some other things, basically. So. Take a look at that handout, and, and you'll have a lot of good ideas on that. So, uh, also, one of the things we're going to do, besides uh, providing these type of education opportunities, is uh, Robin Shelton is going to be uh, putting together some webinars. So, Rob, if you want to come up here and talk a little bit about those. Well, um, thank you, Tom. As Tom mentioned, we'll be doing some. Sorry, I'm a little taller than Tom. Uh, we'll be doing some webinars. Uh, basically, kind of this summer, we'll kick them off and either do roughly two a month. Um, it'll be basically an hour long webinar on various topics uh, from the industry, from agronomy to golf stuff to leadership and stuff. Uh, it's going to help you kind of advance uh, your leadership skills, and links, advance uh, your value to your facility. And those will be, like I said, once or twice a month, an hour. Um, so you get one MSR credit for each hour you do. So you that way don't have to travel somewhere, either right through your computer. Uh, right from your office, I'm up in the facility, so I think it'll be a fantastic way to um, help people get some MSR hours. So stay posted on that. Like I said, those will come out um, towards June uh, this, uh, this summer. So, Tom? <coughs> Thank you, Robin. And uh, we're going to try to keep you apprised to our, if you uh, are on the internet, I'm sure most of you are, our little uh, Southern California member to member and to the program as well. So we'll try to keep you posted on all the educational opportunities that you're going to have. So uh, we've got a treat today. We've got a great panel here. And to uh, introduce the moderator for the panel, he is the general manager at Monarch Beach Links Golf Club, Eric Bowman. Eric, thank you. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. Can everybody hear me okay with this uh, mic? Yeah. Perfect. Well, first of all, let me start off this morning by letting everybody know that this is the first time I've ever hosted this particular seminar, and I'm not a public speaker. So if I fail at this miserably, know that I'm a decent golf professional. So <laughs> I volunteered for this as I thought to myself all weekend, what the hell did I get myself into? But this is what we got ourselves into. I didn't turn it on. Maybe I should just get a little closer to you. First of all, today's topic is about branding. And for those of you who don't know me personally or my career path, I've been associated with branding for many, many years. About 10 years ago or so, I was hired to be the director of sales and marketing by OB Sports Management for a golf course in Palm Springs called Cimarron Golf Resort. And when I got hired for this position, I think the true reasons I got hired for the position was one, I grew up in the town of Palm Springs, and two, I was not afraid to speak in public. Uh, but other than that, I really didn't know much about sales and marketing, and the 
that being said, uh, I had to learn on the job fairly quickly. I, I went to a store and got a book, uh, Marketing for Dummies. My brother would be very proud of me for this. Uh, with that book, Marketing for Dummies, there was a segment in that about branding. And I kind of learned, well, what is branding? How is that important? And how will that make a difference here at Cimarron and some of the other properties I could potentially work at? And uh, I learned on the job fairly quickly. Today, we've got a great panel. I'm going to let them introduce themselves individually. But what we're going to talk about is a way for you to take your individual business or your individual uh, teaching profession or where you happen to work and, and bring it up a notch and actually hopefully uh, compete with the competitive set. So today's topic, how to define, establish, build, promote, and protect the integrity of your brand. And uh, like I said, it should be a fun day. So go ahead. Yeah, that's right. To tee it up, first and foremost, this is a video, a branding video that we shot at Monarch Beach Golf Links, where I'm currently the PGA General Manager. Beach a couple of years ago. These are 
are just some examples of some of the continuity that we have at Monarch Beach. Obviously, you can see the wave that flows through the, the ads. We're definitely playing up the fact that we're next to the ocean. It's the one thing that, that we can have that a lot of our competitive set does not have. So we're going to play that up as much as we possibly can. Uh, but as you can tell with all our ads, and including that branding message, that's not going to work today. Um, that's okay. We'll just wing it. If you want to scroll on, there's another couple more examples. This is sort of a, this is a new ad that we just put out, um, and it's it all kind of plays off of a questionnaire that we did with some of our um, best guests, and some of our members. So it's we asked, you answered, and it, it uh, relates back to all the reasons that our guests, the top five reasons that our guests said that they chose to play Monarch Beach over some of our competitive set. Value, pace of play, course conditions, the experience, and the location. So we really are trying to take our message and our brand right to the consumer, and we are finding out what they want, and we're doing the best that we can to meet those expectations. Okay. At this time, I would like to have my panel introduce themselves, starting with Mr. Chris Strauss. Would you please introduce yourself and why you're here today. Great, great. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Chris Strauss. I'm the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Troom. I'm based out of the Scottsdale. Uh, corporate office at Shroom Golf and uh, uh, worked for Shroom back in the early 90s, 2000s, left for a 10 year hiatus, and that's where I met. And we got to work side by side with Eric in early sports and gone back with Shroom as of August. So thank you for having me. Thanks for being here, Chris. Chris, by the way, is one of my mentors in golf. When I went to work at Cimarron Golf Resort and I didn't know much about sales, marketing, and branding, it was Chris who drove over from our Vegas properties. Uh, to teach me how to do it. So thanks for, it's like a full circle. You get to come back and get beat up on me today. Did he recommend the book, The Marketing Code? No, that was strictly on me. That was, that was on me. There was no internet at the time. My name is Les Lent. I own a sales training, coaching, and consulting company called Sales Coach International. We specialize primarily in B2B selling, but we also work with uh, inside the golf industry, the wedding and event business. Um, we provide sales training, which is the transmission of knowledge and information, and then the coaching is really the uh, execution piece of it. So knowledge is knowing what you're supposed to do, and then coaching is actually doing what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, Travis, sorry, Travis is there for a no. <laughs> uh, My name is Travis Johnson, um, third generation golfer. Uh, played my competitive golf at UCLA and professionally on about seven different tours uh, worldwide. Um, I'm the president and founder of House of Grey, which is the holding company to two of my newest brands, Matt Grey, which is for men, and Heather Grey for women. Uh, I had formerly founded uh, Travis Matthew, uh, as well as Leisure Society, and uh, excited about being uh, part of the panel today. Thanks for coming, Travis. We appreciate your, uh, your time today. Uh, Mr. Will. I just happen to have Eric's last name. That just was coincidental. Uh, but my name is Chris Loman. I'm the co-founder and CEO of an uh, advertising and marketing agency named Saint Street. We're located in Orange County. Our primary focus, at least today, is in the consumer packaged good, food space, fashion, hospitality, and startups. My experience in golf uh, includes playing collegi collegiately at the University of Washington, coaching at the University of Washington, where I offered this guy a full ride and turned me down because he wanted to play golf in a sunnier weather spot. Mm -hmm. I've also worked with golf properties, resorts, uh, golf media, uh, golf fitness training, so I, I definitely have some experience to share with you guys. We'll hopefully tie, uh, tie some of the stories back to what you're trying to accomplish today. And I'm a better speaker than my brother. So. Excellent. That'll be better. I'm well, better at golf, so very much. <laughs> Brett. Hi, I'm Brett Darrow. Um, I've been in this uh, online tea time space for about 15 years. Original founder and CEO of Golf Now. Uh, please don't throw anything at me right now. Um, what I've never heard of. So don't worry. Good. Keep moving forward. Um, started Quick 18 uh, about three years ago, uh, just shy of three years. And really, the whole concept is, is to provide solutions and online technology partners for the golf course and brand, and really give the tools back to the course so they can put their brand in front of everybody. Perfect. Well, thank you guys. Thank you very much for your time today, and I look forward to having you talk a lot more than I do. Um, before we get started, we get too deep into the topic. I do want to thank Alex Eagles and Brandon Locker and David Birdall for putting this together today. We have the best section staff as you hear at all our meetings. 
Um, they worked uh, effortlessly on this all last week, so thank you very much. I'd like to thank my fellow board members of the section and the executive committee for giving me this opportunity, along with the communications and the education committee. And uh, it's, just, it's just an honor to, to be able to do this for you all. And hopefully, like I said, somebody can gain something from this topic today. Whether you run a facility like some of us do, or you know, you're just out there selling yourself, these all kind of play back to what you're trying to pull off. So I hit the clicker now, but the clicker, this is, uh, we can just kind of fast forward through this because without me having a clicker, it's not going to really work. Um, this was an effort for me to kind of tie back with branding and how it plays into our everyday life. Uh, she's going to rip through this and then we're going to talk about a few of these topics and how it kind of would have made sense. Um, what you have here at the very top, obviously, with Ford and Chevrolet, you're two of the most uh, solid brands in American business. It decided to work, okay. Um, Ford and Chevrolet, and then you have Tesla at the very end here at the very top, which is a new brand, and obviously if you're not familiar with Tesla, it's, it's new age technology, it's an electric car, it's kind of everything that Ford and Chevrolet has struggled to, uh, to achieve in the last 20 years, um, but that's kind of why we have that up there. Obviously IBM and Hewlett Packard, and then Apple is the same sort of flow as you've gotten with, with Ford and Chevrolet and Tesla. Um, there's kind of some, there's a, there's a kind of a neat thing, if you can even say Monarch is trying to pull this off, being that we're an older property trying to rebrand ourselves. Uh, Budweiser and Coors, they're the two biggest uh, beer brands in America, for sure, if not the world. And then you have a small little brand called Pabst Blue Ribbon. Uh, for those of you who are in the Metro chapter, you know that we like to have Pabst Blue Ribbon at some of our events. And they're good partners of ours at Monarch Beach. Um, but there's a company, Pabst Blue Ribbon, who has now uh, increased sales by over a billion dollars in the last 12 months solely based on the fact that they're nostalgic and that they're out back in the marketplace. And they've reestablished their brand as not a premium brand, but as a brand that um, kind of goes back to a lot of our youth, uh, my youth at least, and um, it's kind of taken off. One of the examples uh, we're talking about today is how competitive our marketplace is. And the next line down, this is like one of those eye tests a little bit. Um, you have three of the best golf brands in the world for clubs that are all within about five miles of each other from downtown LA. And Los Angeles Country Club, Bel Air Country Club, and the Riviera Country Club. And what we're talking about today is establishing your brand, your personal brand, or your facility brand and then going out there and competing in the marketplace. And can you imagine tougher competition for what is truly the best, not only in Southern California, but the world between those three properties right there? The next line down, we've kind of got some icons that resonate with a lot of people. The Landmark Street. Uh, I grew up at a Landmark Golf Course in Mission Hills Country Club. And you know, here's an example of where a tree can resonate passion with somebody and, and memories. Just by looking at a tree, I think about my youth. I think about me growing up in the game of golf. I think about, you know, Ernie Bosler and, and some of these, you know, guys that just kind of created the high-end daily key golf and resort golf in Southern California. The Ping Man, most of us are familiar with the Ping Man. And how about the fact that a number, like 88, for those of you who are not NASCAR fans, a number can resonate passion. You know, Bill Jr. just won the Daytona 500. And the 88 is probably on um, how many Chevys and Fords right now across the country? Like 500. Um, then at the very bottom, you know, for us at Monarch Beach, this is some of the people that we like to consider to be in our competitive stuff. Uh, we don't know if we deserve it, but we're trying. And that's Pebble Beach and Trump National and Aviara and Pelican Hill and obviously ourselves. So that's a big, big thing we're trying to pull off. And as you can tell by just that, just think how difficult that proposition is. The true definition of branding. <coughs> Important to the success of our business, the matter of the business, how branding plays into perceived reputation of your property. You know, that's a big thing. How branding plays into the perceived reputation of your property. It kind of all kind of goes back to the reputation. Branding is your reputation. Reputation is your brand. Branding establishes what you will market to create leads so that you can close a sale which in turn might produce profit in your operation if feasibly possible. How to, how, to, how to define and establish your brand, your brand. Mr. Strauss, we'll let you. Let's see if the clicker works for me. Hopefully. Great, thank you. Um, 
In my current role, uh, uh, I have oversight of the sales and marketing operations for all of our resort and daily fee facilities in America. And so, I want to clean with the, provide you some, some information on how I kind of structure my day and how we help facilities with, with branding and whatnot. And hopefully, from through that, you can get uh, one or two, three key takeaways you can take back to your facility and implement uh, in your own world. I have no idea what this slide is supposed to say, because this is one that uh, Eric put through in for me. <laughs> this is an example of how branding like affects our daily life and kind of some of the decisions we make. And I was sitting there when I first got this topic, I was thinking, what, what can I can I write up a real life example of branding? And I thought to myself, well here's, you know, I'm walking down the street, I go up to uh, you know, hungry, I'm walking down the street, I walk by a couple of uh, food outlets, I walk by a couple of supermarkets, I decide to walk into a supermarket and uh, buy an apple to eat uh, amongst a lot of different choices. And why did I pick that apple? If you click the clicker, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Here's an example of how branding is plays into health and how as a, as a child, we were all taught this simple, uh, this little simple saying and how it resonates, uh, I think, to this day. And that's just an example of a, of a brand, the apple and the doctor, how they put that together and it still works for this day. That's all you brother. Very, very well. I'm going, to, I'm going to cover that through the presentation here. Uh, I asked Eric uh, if, if it's okay if I kept the trim look on the PowerPoint, and I figured, well, since this topic is about branding, that's part of our brand, so if I took it off, it wouldn't speak to what we're talking about. But uh, uh, my promise this won't be a trim commercial. Again, like hopefully you'll have a few takeaways you can take back. Um, so first of all, um, you know, your brand isn't what you think it is, or the ad campaign that you did last week, or the, the sign you put out front of your, in your facility, it's really what your customers think. So I challenge each and every one of you to kind of take a step back and, and, and make sure we're asking our customers what they think. Make sure we're sending them you know, email surveys after their round. You're doing some annual surveying of your customers, and you're out there and you know managing by walking around, and all those, all those cliches, right? We're, we're hearing from our guests. You know, you know, really what what they think your brand is, and that you know that should help give you some direction and inspiration. And you know, this really resonated well well with me once. Um, you know, that people rally around brands that have purpose. They, they rally around around companies that will put their stake in the ground and really stand for something. So, so my question to you is, what what does your facility? What's your purpose? What what do you what do you put your stake in the ground? And it might be pace of play. It might be you know having the best greens in Southern California. And whatever that is, you know, let's get your entire team on board and rally around that that cause. And you know, it's, it always amazes me. I took this picture again. It, this was at a red light, and, and I have proof of that. You can see the brake lights on. But this uh, this Prius here, in the bottom right corner, there's an Apple sticker on the on this Prius ahead. Of me. Uh, it always amazes me how like, people love that brand so much they're willing to put a sticker on the back of their car that, 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 that says I, I'm an Apple fan. And maybe it goes back to their initial commercial of uh, the guy in the jeans, you know, looking cool like Travis here versus the, the, the stuffy guy like me that's not wearing jeans and whatnot. But, uh, but, but it, put your stake in the ground and stand for something. And be proud of, of your facility. And, and identify your unique selling propositions. Um, have a, have a, in the next week's department meeting, why don't we say, why don't we identify uh, department heads? Let's get together and let's identify what our unique selling propositions are for this facility so that we're all on the same page and we can go to the mar go to market, whether we're interacting with a guest in the front lines or if it's our sales and marketing director at a chamber event, that they're all singing the same song. And I challenge you to, to not have those unique selling propositions be features, have them be benefits oriented. Um, you know, benefits oriented versus feature oriented. It's kind of how I structure my day, how I even try to write each email each day. Like, what's in it for the user? What's in it for the recipient? What's the benefit? And the car manufacturing companies do a great job of promoting benefits oriented um, messages in their marketing that they do. And you know, watch a TV commercial, they don't talk about. How, how many cubic centimeters are in an engine, what kind of transmissions in the car. Are. They're talking about what it makes you feel like when you're in that vehicle, or you've arrived, and you the status you have from driving that Cadillac, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, Chris, real quick. What do you, you think is important with that unique selling proposition? Let's say we do go back to our, our home base, and we would like to sit together with our, um, our team and do this. What, can you give us some examples of what would maybe 
foster a better opportunity? Can there be less thing to speak of it? You know, I can think like I can go back to my place and have this meeting and just start talking or maybe introduce some. Well, first of all, staff. back to the features versus benefit. It's not we are 18 hole championship golf course that's challenging from the back tees. You have playable from the front, 7,000 yards, trying to do blah, 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 blah. We all write that way. <laughs> <laughs> Break that mold and say, forget about that. Let's then, you know, how about how about have your next event here at XYZ facility, and your your attendees are going to walk away in amazement from an exceptional experience. Or we can we can help you raise more money than your competitors if it's charitable in nature. Or or connect with the family when you join our club. You know that that that's those are kind of messaging you want to get together. You get in alignment with the, the facility, and and then. Once you come up with those unique selling propositions, that's how you, that gives you inspiration and purpose for how you're writing your ads, how you're writing an email blast, how you're servicing the guests. And, um, it can help create purpose um, in what you do in each and every day. Let's get more in. Just a little bit. I think it's important to start. If you're, I would encourage you all to do this. What's your? We call it in my my world a uh, PPOD, P -P or positive perception of difference, such that somebody might go out of their way and potentially. To do business with you and, and pay a premium to do it. I think everybody wants that, right? You want people to go out of their way to come do business with you and you want them to pay a premium, right? You don't want to be the best kept secret. You don't want to be the low price leader. So figuring out what that message is is critically important and, and I think it starts with an understanding of the difference between a feature and a benefit. A feature is what something does, a benefit is what somebody gets as a result. And when you do those, Chris went into pre uh, present mode and he's talking about, and we all do it. We're a 40 year old, vertically integrated, blah, blah, blah. Well, every time you make a statement, the person that's on the receiving end of that statement is thinking to themselves, so what? And what they're really thinking is, so what does that mean to me? What do I get as a result of that? So bridge the gap for them and say, we're a beautiful seaside golf links, and what that means to you is, don't leave it to them to figure it out. Tell them what it is that they get. So that would be the one thing that I would add, or the three things that I would add. Great. Great. Can, I, can I add one thing? Absolutely. <clears throat> I think it's important that, as a company, no matter what industry you're in, when establishing your unique selling proposition, is to make sure that everybody who works for your organization believes in it and communicates it, and it permeates throughout your company. If, if you as a top level executive, if you believe in it and your ad says, you know, we're the best at this, but if your employees don't convey that, your customers are gonna read right through it. So make sure it definitely permeates through your organization. Yeah, I mean like the ad that I showed, the one last ad that we asked, and and they told what happened. Those are our five unique selling propositions, and we use it to train our staff when we hire them. We talk about it at our staff meetings to make sure we're on the same page, that we're following that course, and it's really important. Good segue to my next slide, which is there we go. be consistent. And you would instruct a student to, to have a, a variable pre-shot routine every club they stand up to, right? Well, we all need to be consistent in making sure we're perpetuating those unique selling propositions in your branding of your facility and everything we do from the ad campaign to the radio commercial to the way your website looks to the signage in the golf shop from the sale rack and everything in between to the, to the, to the delivery of, of the greeting at the, at the curb by your player service staff. We need to be consistent. Um, certainly, again, I promise it wouldn't be a trim commercial, but it is what I know, so I'm gonna, I have to lean on that a little bit as well too. Um, you know, we, we probably are a great example of someone that's consistent with creating brand recognition with customers. And, um, and, and in many locations, you can see how clubs uh, leverage that brand to their benefit. Um, in this case, it's some local ads. Um, in this case, it's a you know, yardage guide and score cards and some brochures and such. So in, in many cases, a golf course owner will, will hire our company because we're gonna, they're going to leverage the true brand. They want to bring a brand to their property that puts, creates a unique selling proposition, if you will. Um, the flip side of that is much probably to the, what the perception is out there, we also can go the other direction too. And, and in this case, we also we manage the Kapalua. And are we gonna put our brand ahead of the Kapalua brand? No, no we're not. You know, the Kapalua brand already resonates well with customers and we're gonna lead with that brand. We're gonna be consistent in, in, in perpetuating the branding that we have on our website. And there's an email blast example here um, bring it back local, uh, there's a Madera's Golf Club up, up in San Diego. They do a great job. It's kind of hard to see in this slide, but uh, they have this wood grain uh, art look, design look that they're doing and, and everything that they do. And uh, they're real consistent with, with creating a fun, a fun facility that's great for events um, that 
and be their home club for the San Diego golfer, and, uh, and, and they do it really well. Uh, Indian Wells Golf Resort, actually it's kind of hard to even see a trim of Warriors Club over there, but other than that, kind of hard to even see a trim, a trim logo on that, on that campaign there. And we certainly lead with the Indian Wells brand and try to bring more golfers to the destination. Um, a takeaway item would be lead with value. Great, what are we doing to create value added offer, opportunities and offerings to come to the facility? Uh, this was a great lead with value promotion. I, I feel that one of our folks in Arizona where they're bundling it. Rather than just discounting and trying to discount, help discount the guy down the road, uh, they, they, they bundled in value with a, a pair of Oakley sunglasses with their green fees. And they actually have it, um, they actually have it on the booking end in one of the columns there. It's a Oakley Shades of Golf package. And this, Kind of came out with this when Fifty Shades of Grey was getting popular and was trying to have a little fun with it. Fifty Shades of Grey, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's an Oakley Shades of Golf package. So, hey, Chris, can I interject? A yeah, time? I know that there's some people in the room that are um, teachers. They either teach at their facility or they're solely teachers. How many people in the room teach? How many people in the room actually are, per are participating? And Billy McKinney just got up. I think he was doctor. Um, he has a new. Uh, Facebook forum where all the teachers are on it, kind of talking about best practices. And I know there was a topic last week that was on there. Do any of the teachers um, do some like uh, instead of teaching, they're just watching their students' practices, like an additional add-on value. I mean, that's a prime example of do I either charge less to try to beat the guy down the street at Golf Tech, or to you know, outcompete my head coach who's teaching on site, or do I kind of add some extra value to the lesson? <laughs> That's a prime example of how you can do that and, and not uh, not cheat your, your uh, brain. I know quite a few of you sell golf shirts, right? So for my retail clients, we sell golf shirts, we sell women's swimwear, we sell it online, we sell it in retail. What we've come to find is the type of promotion that drives the most sales and the greatest revenue has nothing to do with discount. It has everything to do with added value. So whether it's a gift with purchase, a bounce back, if it's some experience, if it's an enter to win, all of those are going to deliver a greater value in return for us than 50% off or a buy one, get one. They're a dime a dozen. Everybody does it. So what you try to do is you try to add something that somebody else doesn't, that then becomes your unique selling proposition, and then that differentiates you. We all sell golf shoes. Perfect. Well said. Well said. I apologize for the PowerPoint. I got uh, grief from my other fellow panelists about PowerPoint. But, no, uh, PowerPoint, PowerPoint is to sales and marketing guys as uh, tracking the flight scopes. Sorry, you, know, you all. So I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Try to do it. The, uh, the last part of the last segment of the, of, uh, of the presentation here is really to remember that we're not just branding your facility. You're not just marketing um, your tee times for your golf course. You're, we're branding recreational time. We're branding quality time with our friends and colleagues. And we're branding the game of golf. And uh, we're all ambassadors for this great game. And we're all lucky to be a part of the, the game that, that holds such a special place in our hearts. And we got to remember that that we, we really need to be doing what we can to introduce more people to the game of golf, to our facilities. Um, I sat across the, the, the desk from David Barmany, our, again, our, our founder, chairman, and CTO, and he's like, Chris, I want you to be thinking five, ten years down the road, like, who's going to replace all these golfers? Uh, don't be thinking about today, let's be thinking about tomorrow. And certainly it inspired all of us in the room, because it's all something we have control over, something that we all can do, and, um, and share our passion with others. And uh, what, what are we up against? You know, we all, I mean, I'm not going to belabor all the stats that are out here, but the one few stats that I did uh, find, I know Eric wanted me to touch on some industry trends, and certainly we had, you know, we had a high of 30 million golfers in 05, and, and according to the, the NGF in 12, I don't think their final final data that was yet for 13, we're down to 25 million golfers. So we know that's a challenge. We, 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 we've gone, we've slid a little bit, a little lot. Um, and participation rate went from 11% down to 8.8%. So. It looks like the brand of golf is not doing well. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's definitely that's, that's, a, that's definitely a buff, right? that's definitely a challenge. Uh, there's a few more stats here that um, a running I found a running stat that there's there's 50 million active runners out there. There's 18 mil over almost 19 million female runners, 
And the NGF says that there's 5 million female golfers. So what can we do to help have, uh, uh, help curb that trend? How, how to grow the women, being with women golfers in our own community? Um, we, I kind of, I do like to steal a little line that, that Nike uh, speaks to. Um, Nike has an approach where they're, where they're globally present but locally relevant. So uh, in my world with what we do, uh, from a trim standpoint, we try to create global programs that have local relevance. And I think that's, that's the, I think that's, you know, you can put that on anything else that we're talking about, get golf ready or international initiatives. We have, that's the global present, but then what we do locally and how we're rolling up our sleeves and doing that with the local community and how we're introducing one new player to our facility that wasn't there last week, that's how we're gonna win this, win this war, right? Um, it, these are a couple of interesting stats. Junior golf, uh, in 12, there's 2.7 million junior golfers down from a high of 3.8 in 05. Um, they go up from 11 to 12, so that's positive. Um, beginning golfers uh, down from 2.4 million in 2000, down to 1.9 in 2012. And again, that one went from 1.5 to 1.9 from 11 to 12. That could be, that could be a testament to what we're doing from a, a and or grow the game initiatives, so that's that's good, but it needs to be more than that, right? Um, well, you can say, well, yeah, okay, well, participation declined, but all these golf courses around me closed, so that's a good thing for us. Well, um, you know, again, eight, and these stats are 13 stats. This is the eighth year we've had a net decrease in golf course openings uh, in the country, uh, so there's you know more courses that closed than opened. And yeah, that's a positive today in that you have a little bit less competition, um, but it's also a sign of maybe the, a little bit of a sign of the health of what's going on. Hey, Chris, with this one um, slide, we actually, when we did the OB Sports uh, Chan Conference, this was a big slide that we all talked about globally and nationally with OB Sports, the company that I work for now, that used to work for, because we have 45 properties across uh, the United States. And, and it's something like this, you look like net change in course supply. How does that affect us? How does it affect the people in the room? Well, take a guess the one market that isn't really seeing a net effect in a, in a negative way. What's the number one market that is not seeing a negative net effect? It's our market. So although you could be in like Omaha, Nebraska, Duluth, Minnesota, or wherever, they're seeing golf courses that are closing because they can't succeed, where then some other golf courses are actually starting to prosper. Our market, we're seeing very few closures, and we are actually seeing some additional properties planned for the next five to 10 years. So I, I would also throw out that the ones that are closing, what kind of properties are they? If you look a little <coughs> deeper into these stats, they are part three courses, the nine hole courses. They're the, they're the bunny slopes of golf. Those are the ones that are closing. So we all, as operators of 18 hole championship golf courses or 36 hole facilities, have an obligation to try to recreate those experiences in, in little chunks to introduce the game of golf in a way that's 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 welcoming, much like a par three course or executive course. So, um, we actually did a survey to all the trim customers this year. Um, it went out in February. We had about 10% response rate. It was awesome. Uh, we, it was like 87 questions, so we um, it was pretty in depth. We don't do it every year, but uh, we wanted to find out more about our customers and. You, you all are the first folks that have seen this outside of our company, but there was a few uh, questions that were answered in ways that I thought would be uh, inspirational to this group. So let me um, dive into a couple of those. We, had, we asked the usual stuff, like demographics and all that kind of stuff, and how often do you play, and yada yada, but we also had some, we had some grow the game questions that we wanted to dig deeper into what our customers think. Um, what would you change about the game of golf? Number one reason, 70% said time, flicker, river, face play. Look at what's number two. Fun and friendlier service. How much does that cost? Nothing, right? That's in how we inspire our team. That was number two. And this, again, this is, we asked them, <coughs> our customers, what, what, would, what would you change? Uh, what, what factor is most important in you choosing where to play golf? And 35% said course layout and style. Notice price is not number one. Price is number two, 29%. So that's good to know that price was uh, number one. I mean, it could be, Resonate. It could be could speak to what um, you know who our customers are a little bit, but I would say again, leading with value, this supports that cause. I hope there's not any golf course architects in the room, but there's only 0.7 said the architect uh, impacted where they play golf. But again, I have I go back to well, they also had influence in the course layout style. 
What would you change about the game to grow participation with women golfers? You know, this one was a, uh, was a question where you could select multiple options, so um, it doesn't add up to 100%, so preface it with that, but affordable golf options, more female instructors and programs, or I. Golf and social combo events, more nine hole events, shorter tee options. Now, do you have a 4,000 yard set of tees? If not, we're putting, pushing people down the blue runs instead of putting them on bunny slopes. Um, what would you change about the game of golf to grow participation with juniors? More affordable by far, number one. Free or $10 weekly junior clinics. I shared this with all of our directors and instructions in our company and said, you know, if we're not doing something to get them in the first time, you know, again, get them in the first time and then give them the, the five lessons for $99. So then we get them hooked, you know. But my, my wife goes to a physical therapy uh, uh, place to, to have some work in her ankle and her, and her shoulder. And they have free yoga classes on Wednesday just to get people into the facility so that when they do get hurt, they'll hopefully think about going to them for, over their competition. That's their unique selling That's the That's what differentiates them. It brings value. Yeah, brings value, right? You know, I kind of also blame participation rates probably on people like myself, on marketers. Um, if we had a $75,000 marketing budget for a golf facility, how much of that am I spending on marketing instruction, instructional programs? If I'm spending this much, because I'm spending it on driving clean fees and things that are driving 100% revenue, where in the instruction world I might only get 20% of the revenue or whatever the deal is I have. They might even be an independent contractor, so they might only be they don't want to be as good of marketers. They are good at marketing. But we need to get really good at marketing instruction. Um, and I'm not saying we're going to be able to shift any of those dollars or a lot of those dollars over right away, but there's a lot of free tools to do that. We all have databases of customers. There's a great example from one of our clubs in, in, uh, in Chandler, Arizona, that did um, you know, play in a four-hole loop for 10 bucks. You know, women on course event, instructional. This whole email blast that went on on their Tuesday email was all about getting into the game playing the game or bringing your spouse in to learn the game. Um, and and that, that's, we need, to, we need more of that. We can do that. It doesn't cost us anything. We can do social media, which Chris will speak to. How do you bring the ocean to Chandler, Arizona? Well, that was some Papalua images of the race. Oh, I said so. just dropped in the ocean on Chandler. Yeah. <laughs> I miss the ocean. Some of in Arizona. I'm not blessed with it. You have to pay a license fee to pay out to know. <laughs> we need to make it fun, you know, we need to not be afraid of doing some fun things. It's, uh, you know, we have, it's me in a snag suit at a conference, and that's us playing snag down the halls. And there's a big fun uh, event that we had at Madaris in San Diego. Where's, where's Josh Alper? I saw him walking around with Josh. So we, uh, Monarch Beach uh, sponsored the Toshiba this weekend, and we had the suit out, and we had some of the snag equipment, and by far it was like the most popular thing. I mean, I literally got to the point where I had to walk up to people and say, hey, by the way, we, this is Modern Beach sponsored this snag stuff because nobody cared about us. They just cared about hitting the, the person in the suit. And I bet you, uh, you know, the, I bet you a few more spouses came up because you had snag. All there. kids versus, and all women. Versus, and drunk uh, men. Versus <laughs> six hundred. <laughs> right, well, we need to all be making this game fun and doing what we can to, and, and not be afraid of some of these, some of these things. And, we need to be developing our, our, our future customers. You know, my first, uh, this is this is my way of getting my 13 year old in slideshow on the left hand side of the picture. So, um, the, uh, you know, my first lesson. She's 13 years old. I, I, I paid for her. For, she finally said, Dad, I want to get into golf. And I've, she's been on golf all her life, and, and she can play golf for free. And she's I, so the price isn't a barrier for us, right? But she's not into golf. And, and she finally said she wants to get into golf. And I can take her off her first lesson. It's sixty dollars for an hour lesson. For a 13 year old. And I just started thinking, my gosh, not everybody can do that. That's just, doesn't, that's tough, you know? And, you know, Kathy Nadler, the LPGA Girls Golf in Phoenix, she did a little study of recreational pursuits and, and figured, figured out the average was about 13 to 17 bucks an hour if you were going to sign your kid up for recreational soccer or volleyball or whatnot. Here I'm, you know, we're, we're paying 60 bucks an hour. So, um, you, know, you know, let's, let's you know, and I, we have corporate programs like our Trim Family Golf programs and our Player Development Months, and that, that's great. And then what are we doing, again, what are we doing at our facilities to make it affordable for kids to get into the game or get interested in the game and provide that inspiration? Then once they get serious, then charge that 60 bucks an hour. But. Hey Chris, for, quick, the, for those of you who don't know, Monarch Beach does not have a practice facility. We have about four hitting bays and a small chipping and putting green. And I've been there 
20 months or so, and obviously there are a lot of people that before me, and the best that we can tell, there's never been a successful blessing program ever. Obviously without dry range, it could be tough. So we, the two programs that we introduced that actually made a difference, one was a program I called the Golf Physical, which was kind of like a full swing evaluation. We threw in a free run of golf with that, that instantly made that a successful program. And we just uh, finally took Nikki Gash's uh, comments and her persistence to do a Get Golf Ready. And we finally did it, and we had about 15 or 16 people sign up for a Get Golf Ready class. That's great. How many people actually signed up for the first program you mentioned? The Golf Physical, like 130, 140 Within people. like a day. Within 24 hours. It was the most popular thing we've ever done on the internet. And what did you get a golf lesson and a golf course that didn't have a driving range? I think the three less, I think the three yeah. round made a big difference. Probably. But uh, those who actually took the program came back and said it was worthwhile and it was worth it. We did it in off week time and it was very profitable for the instructor, myself, and for the club. Yeah. We all have capacity and there was an off week time, as you said. Um, you know, our trim family golf thing is certainly at that capacity <coughs> that after three o'clock, one child plays free with a regular thing and don't. And, uh, we have room after three o'clock. We have 65 facilities domestic and that do that. That. And a lot of them do it more than they do it after two or after do it at noon or in the summer times in Arizona, they might do it all day, right? Um, we have free runoff clubs for kids, and, and you know, we just buy a few of your Callaway sets and junior golf sets and, and then provide that at no charge, and that's a barrier, right? I mean, again, I have a 9, 11, 13 year old. Um, I don't think I really have a, the right kind of set for each of those. <laughs> I don't know that. Well, I think I'd like to give kudos to Steve Plumbers in the room from Tusk Ranch. And Steve, has been an independent for a few years now. It doesn't work for a management company. And you, you probably are the leader in Orange County for family golf. And I would say, I don't know if that was your passion or not, but then you started the first day of Orange County. I don't know if that's a derivative of that or that just kind of was a byproduct. Or, what's that? Separate. I know it's separate, but I don't know if you just woke up one day and said, I got to help junior golf. But there's a guy who embraces family golf and is, is somewhat responsible for the first day of Orange County. So thank you, buddy, for doing that. Because we stepped up. Couple more quick takeaways. We uh, we need to get players on the course quicker. And uh, you know, when when uh, we asked uh, another question in another survey, you know, how likely are you to choose a course that, that has a pace of play program and consistently enforces it? And Ninety percent of the customers answered that they'd be more likely to choose a course that has those uh, pace, a pace of play program and is serious about it. And uh, you know, one of our senior ops VPs spoke at the USGA uh, Pace of Play Symposium in November and shared a lot of the data, shared this program, this is uh, your trim values your time, or at the facility levels, Madera's values your time, or Indian Wells values your time. And, and, uh, and it, it's not a perfect system, but we're trying, and uh, we have some hard data that shows that it's improving Pace of Play through the GPS partners. And pace of Play improved by 11 minutes in the first four months of the program. And, we set the expectation for the guests of what it's going to take to play, play golf. And a lot of people might think you're, they should be playing in 3.45 or three and a half hours, but the reality is you know, our golf courses might not be set up for that. So in this case, Indy Wells has a 4.29 number on there, which um, it sets the expectation right out of the gates. I mean, if, if a server tell, comes up to your table at dinner and says, uh, dinner, you know, the, your order is going to take 15 minutes to get out tonight, then they've set the expectation. Um, if they don't tell you that and you're waiting, you know, 15 minutes, you're going to say, it's taking too long. Uh, same kind of thing. And then we also incent the players as well. In the case of Indian Wells, if they finish below 429, they can come in for an appetizer and get um, a $4.29 appetizer after the round. So there's an incentive for the player. A lot of people think the onus is on us as operators to help with pace of play, but it's a shared ownership. It's us and it's the, the guests. And the best. So, Chris, I remember you've got the panel. What, you know, why is that such an important why is pace of play so important to our brands? And then second, when you when you post something that says like 4.30 or 4.29, I mean, you're setting a pretty high standard. You know? So what happens if you don't live up to that expectation? Well, I don't know. Any of you guys just kind of take it? Great. Well, the first question would, was, why is it important? Why is it why important? Why do we care? Well, if you look back at what we saw in terms of our, of our customer surveys, um, that's what they changed. What would you change about the game of golf? Number one, by far, 70.9% said <coughs> change the time and pace of play. Um, if you, you know, industry industry challenge that this game takes too long and we don't have five hours for a round of golf. Um, 
certainly by setting the expectation at 429, yeah, the guests that are finishing at 445 in five hours, you're going to have you're going to have some challenges to, to, to overcome that if they didn't have that experience. But um, you know, we we speak to the fact that well, there are pace setter times in the morning that are set aside for people that play 20 minutes faster than those times, and we, we direct you to that. And I think at least if they see that you're trying, you get a, you get some street cred. You get you get a little bit of extra bonus points for at least trying, even if you fall short. You still have to do the guest recovery as if you fell short without this. You do a five and a half hour round, you're gonna have guest recovery to get to overcome. Um, and that's what makes us good in the hospitality business, right? We, we, can, we can win them over and charm them to do that. This is something that um, actually I showed in a course a couple weeks ago and they were talking about this whole pace of play piece. And they were very difficult golf course to play and they were averaging on Saturdays at peak time. 542 was the Round and it was just ridiculous. And the owner said, came in two years ago, bought the facility, and said, "This is it has to change. We have to make a difference here." Um, and they're down to 425. And they just absolutely just said, "You know what? We're going to make this change, and we're going to push people. We're going to say, when you check in, we expect you to play in 4:30, right? And if you don't play in 4:30, and we're going to push you ahead. And if you, you know, you're going to give a warning to go forward and go, and if you're not, then you're going to get pushed ahead a whole. If you have a problem with that." Here's your money back. That's just not for us. And they, they're now, it's just completely the opposite, right? They had that whole issue of customer service issue with the five and the you know, five fifty. Now it's the other way around, where they're gaining customers because they know they're playing for third. And it's just something they instilled and just made it sure that this was something we were going to do with this property. And I think this goes right to this whole pace of play issue that the whole industry has. But it can be done. That definitely can be done. You have to it's come from the top and you really have to push it. I got a question for Bill and Paul. How big is the pace of play amongst your conversations with your group? Well, it's interesting because you know it's the USGA initiative, but you know, we feel like it was something that came out that don't know if it really made a difference. We'll discuss that to some extent. And obviously, you know, some people said, why hasn't the PGA uh, been more active in that role? And I think one of the challenges is is to come up with a program that we think we're going to have success with. Um, you know, we haven't really come up with anything that we focus on right now, but it's a new program. Yeah, I would add, I mean, I think there are two fundamental pace of play issues. There's the, what you're talking about here, how do you decrease the time of the round? So let's say from five hours and 20 minutes to 4.30, which is great for the golf, the current stage of people who play golf. But then there's the other pace of play issue, depending on how you read the data, when people are saying they want to change the amount of time it takes to play golf, is that going from 4.45 to 4.30 are saying what we think is, you know, a lot of people don't have four hours and 45 minutes, but they also don't have four and a half hours. So what do you do for someone, a family, a mother, a father, who only has two hours? And how do you start to redefine the golf experience, but yet make it still revenue-based, where there are options based on how people spend their time in, in modern society, because if you look at other activities, whether it's going to the gym or going to a yoga class or going to a movie, it's 60 minutes, it's 90 minutes, maybe it's an hour and 20 minutes or two hours. But the golf proposition for the non-golfer is <coughs> tough activity for an mm -hmm. But one of the things you'll hear from the PJ of America uh, National over the course of the next 18 months is how do you start to redefine that experience? So if you have a half an hour or two hours or three hours, there's an answer. Maybe it's taking a lesson, maybe it's getting involved, maybe it's participating in a clinic, maybe it's playing three holes, six holes, nine holes. So I think there are two avenues we need to go down. We need to make it better for the, let's say, 12 million, 9 million, 10 million avid golfers out there, and then we need to create a formula that works for the rest of society. And we analogize it to, uh, to basketball, where if Paul and I were going to go out and play basketball, maybe we'll play one-on-one, -on -one. we might grab Bill and Pat and play two-on-two, -two. we might play a game of horse. <coughs> but we do it for an hour, an hour and 45 minutes, we say, hey, that was fun, we played basketball. It didn't have to be five-on-five, five, uh, four 12-minute quarters on a regulation court with a referee. And golf, I think, is a feeling, and what we're starting to talk about is maybe golf in many ways is shooting itself in the foot by trying to always jam it Right. Not that that should be replaced, that's, <coughs> that's the ultimate experience. But to get more people in the game, how do you show some flexibility to that one? Well, I mean, it, you know, as an operator that, that has a bottom line that I worry about, and you know, I have goals that are set forth on the ownership group and our management company, you know, those 18-hole equivalents 
peak time Saturday morning, they pay the bills. And, but do they grow the game? Do they, you know, then we cram the golf course, and we're trying to make all this money as we can make, and then you get the, it wasn't our course, but the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But we, we talked in our business planning session, that's the double-edged sword that our professional mm -hmm. operators are struggling with. We were discussing, remember Donnie brought up, how do you charge? You charge by the hour, you charge mm -hmm. by the, and at the end of the day, it's almost like as operators or owners, we don't want to give this up because we can't take the hit on the bottom line. But if we don't give it up, so we're not going to grow the game. So it's really uh, it's 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 Think about bowling. You know, I don't know if you've had bowls or whatever. You had a bowl for 400 bucks. Mm -hmm. Jesus, who the hell's going to go bowling? You know? My back would still hurt. My, my back hurts thinking about it. But you know, one of the things that, like at our facility that we're talking about, more and more of is the hour and a half before sundown. Usually you have your prime time, your twilight, your super twilight, whatever. But then you have this hour and a half before sundown where a few members might come out, you know, maybe some staff will go play, a couple kids will go play, but literally you're as busy as you can be from sun up through about the hour and a half before sundown, yet you have these three or four us, we have five holes around the ocean. You know, are we really taking advantage of that canvas? Are we really taking advantage of it? So one of the things that we're probably going to introduce is, is like a some sort of Get Golf Ready, Play Golf America, an inexpensive but fun experience that's towards the last hour and a half of the day. And you know, I'm not afraid to share this information because I think the rest of us should look into it. Because I know when I was growing up and all the golf courses I go play, that's when it was the, the least busy. And now I want to go play when it's the least busy and you know when it's sunset and it's cooler and it's not as windy and so there's an opportunity there possible. Chris, I'd be interested in that room with the multiple, you know, facilities obviously. Is there any, has there been any thought given on activities for children to make it easier for their parents to play, whether it's golf or non-golf? Yeah, I, I think you, you got to kind of break the mold of the old junior camp mm -hmm. and not just rely on the way we used to do it or the way we've always done it. And, you know, like we're, we're, we're seeing some of our directors and instructors get creative with, with doing the junior clinic at the same time that they have a get mom into golf kind of clinic, and we're, we're doing, we're coinciding and putting them right next to each other so that the, the, the little Johnny can learn from the little snag, but then mom can be there with the rest of the moms and get into the game. So we're, I think that's that might, that's a solution. Now, again, we're just, a lot of this, we're all just, we're chipping away at it. There's no silver bullet to solve this challenge, but that's one example of how we're trying to overcome that. The, you mentioned the short loops. Um, you know, the four hole loop that Opakio was doing, I was like running up and down the hallway, like high five people when I saw that. I was so excited to do that because that would appeal to, you know, mom, that would appeal to, to dad to get out after work, that would appeal to the junior golfers, and they have cool, some cool family keys that are set up on those four holes as well. Um, in a dream world, I would be extremely rich, and I'd have enough money to build a golf course, and my golf course would have six hole loops. I'd go out and back six, you know, three times for six holes, and then my, my customer could elect six, 12, or 18. I don't know how many you got. I mean, I'd pick the 12 hole loop probably 90% of the time. With time, my energy level, you know, if I walked it, it would be a perfect walk. Um, but, you know, I don't know how golf is, and how many of those have been built in the world? How novel of an idea is that? The other thing we've seen that we kind of like is there's a couple of other groups that have figured they have a pro programming that works, seems to work. You know, we've done some sassy golf clinics and we've done women on course, which I know you gotta be careful of here and make sure it's open to everyone here in Southern California. Um, the, uh, the, but they, you know, I liked how they had the option where you can do a lesson, you can do four, a lesson in four holes and then nine holes. And they all had them going out at the same time. Um, and so, depending on what level you are, um, this is actually women on course's model, but certainly something you can deal and do from a program standpoint here in the facility where you have three different offerings and they're running concurrently. They all meet up in the restaurant afterwards. So regardless of what program you went through, um, you, you can you can hook back up and they can connect with others. Um, so we like that as well. We're trying to host them in as many places as we can. But when a man calls us up and asks if they can participate, we want to make sure we say yes to that too. We want to grow the game regardless of <laughs> gender or uh, whatnot. So Chris, does anybody have any questions so far? Question. We have a mic for them, or they just going to talk about it. You know what, what? I like your idea with the, the three sixes. <coughs> I'm, I'm thinking of the golf course design has a big impact on pace of play one. And most of the courses now, you have to take cards because there's so much space between the you know, range and the tee box. Uh, 
so uh, that, that, I haven't heard you guys really uh, talk about that as much as far as new golf courses are. You know, like the, the, the groups that I'm involved with, and some of these fellows are actually developers that are in the room. Um, first of all, we just saw the slide where there isn't a lot of development going on. So there might not be much development going on in the future. And it could be 10, 15, 20 years before we see a significant increase in development. Uh, I think that there, I, I think there, there's people out there who are smart enough, who are crafty enough to take advantage of some of these ideas. I think you're seeing it in some other ways within golf. I don't know. There's that all, all for all sports. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but the digitized hitting bays. Has anybody seen that? Um, if you haven't, there's driving ranges that are popping up in large metropolitan areas. Top golf. Top golf. Okay, top golf. It, used to, it was started by one of our executives in Kemper Sports. And Top Golf just took an idea, not idea, a driving range, which to some of us is boring and repetitive and just not that fun. And they, um, they're they spending a million or two dollars to upgrade this facility so that when you hit in the targets, it keeps score, it makes noise, there's like a good bar, there's some sort of social environment that's there. I mean, think about it. somebody 15, 20 years ago came up with that idea, found the capital, started to invest, and now they're starting to see some dividends with those places like in Dallas and some of these other markets that they're in are actually very profitable. And, it, and that's a novel concept. Right? $20 million is the average top dollar for every year. $20 million for a driving range. One, one, one site. $20 million bucks. So there's, you know, I think that the people who can take that sort of idea and then apply it to a regular 18-hole facility or they build this new facility, I think there's a fighting chance. But it's like you have to be in front of it. You have to convince the person with the money or the person who's going to buy that out in one of the, the closures and renovate it so that this is an opportunity. Because most of our golf courses just can't do it. I mean, Pelican Hill couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I mean, if you're going to, if the six hole is 2.8 miles away like it is at most golf courses, it just doesn't work. So you have to be in front of it, not behind it. Um, first of all, thanks for all this. This is tremendous. I mean, for all of us uh, to be able to listen to the leaders, it's huge for us to be here today. So thanks for hosting. Um, I just was just want to, I was just struck by the thirty million golfers in two thousand five, twenty five million golfers in two thousand twelve. Obviously, that's a decrease. Um, we're talking about branding and, and looking at what it is our customers want. Uh, we kind of sound just quickly here. We've got this group of golfers. Of how do we retain the people we already have in the game to maximize numbers? And then the other challenge is how do we bring new players into the game? Uh, obviously, children and women and, and the different demographics that we quote unquote used to go after once upon a time. Um, there, the customer is saying we want fun, we want friendlier, we want fast around nine holes, etc. And I didn't get the exact what it came down fast, but it sounded like uh, we determined that the par three executive courses are the ones that are closing at greater rates. Um, from a PGA or larger branding standpoint, it just seemed very quickly if our customer is asking for faster, friendlier, funner, um, maybe the effort to, to figure out how to remarket or rebrand those entry level points so that we are doing a better job at, as, a, as a larger industry of creating value for those things. Right. And those are the ones that drive it anyway. I work at a nine ball course. Right. Um, I'm fortunate to work with kids of LA members, Ballet members, Riviera members. We get we get the, the So you appreciated my slide presentation? Love it. Thank but, you. But, but you throwing did. that side out as opposed to losing it would seem a very logical way well, I, to you know, I know that President Johnson and, and um, Executive Director Tom Addis, and we've spoken about this as a, as a board of directors, and I know that somebody in the room here, Mr. Tabacco from the PGA of America, is he's somebody that would probably need to hear this and think about it because there are we are closing some of those properties down. I think in, in San Diego there's the Presidio, if I'm not mistaken, either has closed or might close or was going to close. And there was a conversation of who, would, who could buy that and turn that into a – like a play golf, you know, get golf ready, play golf America facility. Well, it's going to have to be somebody with deep pocketbooks and somebody who's willing to ride out the storm for a few years until that becomes an economically feasible operation. And, you know, is there an opportunity out there for people like that? For that? Yeah, I think there is. But it's going to take probably the associations or it's going to take somebody like a, I don't know, Warren Buffett, but he's not a golfer, but somebody who loves golf who's a billionaire to say, you know what, I'm going to. Instead of me donating all my money to the Oklahoma State Sooners, I'm going to buy 15 of these places across the country. I'm going to turn it into something cool and different, and I'm going to grow the game out. But some of me, like 
who has power, who meets with these people, are going to have to sell, upsell that proposition. I was trying to get into the mind. Why don't we, for the sake of time, we've got some other great topics, but thank you for their input. Last couple of slides here, and pass on to other topics that we can cover. But uh, we need to use the golf courses for more than just golf. We need to have you know, concerts, or there's a couple of we have fun runs. We do fun runs on our courses through our Twin Fifth program. We have bike races that end up at the clubhouse. And, and look, we got to keep doing that and be creative. Again, the, the run the run was uh, this run in the bottom right corner. We had 200 people do this 5K fun run on the back nine. And, uh, and if you don't think that that grows a game, it does. Is my daughter's question when she asked, Dad, I want to start playing golf, it was after we did that fun run. She saw the sun rising and saw how beautiful the course was. And she asked that question. Uh, and then the last one, would leave it with uh, a quote that, that uh, John Easterbrook, our PGA member, the vice president of our company, said to our leadership at the conference. We had 400 people in the room, all our trim leaders. And, and he said, it's everyone's job in this room to grow the game of golf. And I could have been more proud of the organization I work for. Um, and I know you all know that. Um, it's everyone's job in this room to grow the game of golf. We all um, have a responsibility to the game and to our owners. Um, so let's let's be creative and keep uh, keep grinding on some of these thoughts and ideas and figure out how we can implement it locally at your facility. Thank you, Chris Strauss. Here's your information, Chris. Thank you. Um, <laughs> actually, just to recap, everybody, this, True North, True North, True North. Uh, this uh, presentation will be available to you via uh, email, we'll, we'll email to everybody, and at the very end there's a contact page that everybody can take if they'd like to reach out to any of the select panels for whatever reason. Um, we're going to kind of power through some of these slides, and if you have a question, just raise your hand, we'll ask you. Um, these folks have kind of got some stuff teed up, and if you'd like to get to this, more important than me talking, but... Obviously, this all plays back to branding and why is that important. Obviously, your brand is your selling proposition. And you need to be honest uh, when you evaluate your valued asset. Um, no matter what you do, like here at Monarch Beach, you know, we did have that, that conversation with our staff. We sat around and we talked about what we were, what we weren't. Um, we had to figure out what we really were and then you know, try to build upon that so that we can actually break into some of the market share. But you have to be very honest. You, know, you can only do what you can do. You're only as good as you, you think you are. And uh, there, should, there could be some operational facility limitations or ownership limitations or management <coughs> limitations um, that could hinder your, your progress. So when you do pick out whatever you're going to be, uh, you've got to make sure it's the right thing. Uh, perception is reality. Employees versus guests versus owners versus managers versus competitors. You know, I put this slide up here because, you know, I think it's kind of funny. Like, I onboard all my employees. And I sell them, a, you know, I sell them a bill of goods. This is what we're like. This is what we're about. This is who we are. By golly, you better stick to that. And that's what we're moving forward. Then we tell our guests via the ads, that's what we're going to be. Then we tell our owners in an ownership meeting, where they tell us, more importantly, what they think we should be. Then you have the managers sit around a weekly management meeting. They kind of talk about what we really are, where we're doing well and we're not doing well. And then you've got your competitors. And, you know, the brand is, is sort of your reputation. It's what you stand up and you sell. This is what I'm about. And, you know, do your employees have the same brand perception as you? Do your guests have the same perception as you and your employees? And down the list. And it's amazing if you just try the simple exercise with your group of leaders or, or even your entire team and see what kind of answers you get. And when we first did this, every single segment had a different answer. The employees thought you know everything was super casual, super fun. You know, who cares if we keep the money? Who cares if we, you know, live up to our expectations? The guests, you know, they thought it was probably a little bit informal. Some people loved it and some people didn't like. They didn't quite get the value proposition they were promised. The owners, they, they thought it was, uh, you know, Taj Mahal. The managers were all over the board because they didn't have a leader to actually put them, hold them together and find a concise brand message that they could buy into. And the competitors were just simply kicking out. You know, so we had to get all these groups of people together to think of what we're going to be and then try to go out and get it. Branding is all about what is in the mind, the mind of the consumer and the mind of the employee. It's highly recommended that they all have the same idea of what you're doing. What differentiates yourself, your property from the rest? I think Chris kind of touched this. Chris Lohman, Travis is going to be able to talk about this in a little bit as well. Um, why does it need to be different? How can you make it different? Real life examples from the panel. Travis. Why is being different important in retail? 
Does it really matter? Golf shirt's a golf shirt, right, though? I think it's uh, important in, in every aspect. Um, you know, to speak today on branding. Um, everyone here has their own individual brand. Everyone here uh, has their own individual brand, the company they're at, uh, the facility. And the thing we have drawn up on our wall at the office is, you know, why? And uh, we always ask ourselves, you know, what can we do to not be a need to brand? Um, what are our differences or um, selling pieces? Um, because at the end of the day, having the same thing offered in your shop um, isn't speaking to all the different people who are walking in there. There's so many different people that approach the game from a beginner to uh, someone who's been around for uh, 30, 40 years at the club. Uh, you want to have it hedged the right way so it matches your membership, obviously. And what we've always done with our products and our brands is try to create different from the standpoint of growing the game. Um, um, like I said earlier, third generation golfer. My, my father runs junior golf here under the John, Johnson Junior Golf Tour. Um, sister played, mother played, everyone played. So for us and myself as well in my career, it came to a point where I realized I could make a bigger impression on golf through the business side as opposed to playing. And so how could I do that? And I was through apparel because of, there weren't many. In, in 2006, 2007, there wasn't a brand that was bringing fun and excitement to the game. And uh, while I was playing, competing worldwide, I was sponsored by Adidas at the time. And nothing against Adidas, but I wasn't proud of the logo I had on my chest the same way I was proud of, about having the Ashworth logo when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. That brand personified cool. And um, so for me, I just saw a great opportunity to create something unique, create something different, add some fun. We're all here to grow the game. We're all here because we have so much passion and love for it. And it's just so important to offer different, I think. And it's it's very easy to get caught in our old ways because, well, this has been selling you know, forever here in the shop, or um, this is what my members buy, but how many other members are we missing that are buying their clothes from Nordstrom or from the moving bills or from different boutiques because that guy wants to be different. He doesn't want to show up in the same shirt or the same color as another guy from the club. So um, for us, it's, it's the, uh, I think it's the foundation of what we try to do, uh, as respectful as possible in a game of history and tradition. And so that's the, there's a fancy line you gotta ride, but at the same time, you know, to the point earlier about top ball, um, I know a few of the guys over there, and I mean, they've really turned golf upside down and come at it from a pure entertainment standpoint, or then you see how well they're doing there. So it's, it's I imagine it's gonna be a great challenge to preserve the heritage of golf, um, all of that, at all the neon lights and, you know, but it's something I think all of us are challenged with and that we face on, you know, what does our brand, what does our facility, how are we gonna market, what we're, how we're different, as well as what outside the box can we completely do that um, the way, you know, at, at our old company, or the Dawson tour and the, the big band that came out, like that was providing something unique and different. Uh, that was the whole core purpose of that. Um, so I think it's, it's something we face every day and trying to figure out what our runner is and, and market the heck out of that thing. Now did you, when you were deciding to, to start these companies, did you, were you thinking like, oh, that shirt has to be red and striped and, and decay, or were you thinking like, this is the brand, I think this is what I'm going to go after and get, now i got to build back into it. Or did you build it first and then step back and say, well, that's where it's going to fit the segment of, of the market. You know, Which came first, the brand before the egg? Or the it was first? always the product. Um, in fact, I mean, the first brand, Travis Matthew, was like a 24-hour decision because the brand we had created prior to it. Uh, we realized um, whether there's a likeness issue. And all my samples overseas, Seven, we're literally getting embroidered the next day. And the trade show is coming up in two months. I'm just going, what the heck are we going to name this thing? <laughs> um, and so, but back to your question, uh, it was always a product. It was, um, and again, we weren't just going to try to make another polo. We're going to bring back the cardio collar, the um, stick pocket, the um, cuff sleeves. Um, again, it was something that we all wore because we bought it at Robert Dunn. Or through her with your uh, other different brands that had cool things. What can we grab and absorb from those? Bring in the golf. 
focused on what are the colors that are in all of our closets. Uh, a lot of times companies hire out design staff that are great designers, but they, they wouldn't fit on them. They did the whole process to come in and try to interpret golf as opposed to looking at what has been done in golf, what should be done in golf, what a golfer's comfortable with wearing. There's also the guy, 10% of them that want to wear a bright green shirt or a bright pink shirt, whatever it might be, and that's, that's fun and that adds to the game. But for us, it's not so much about um, doing what everyone else does in the game and, and books. It's more so about the product, and that's every single detail from the pocket depth to the pocket placement and all those different things to make sure it resonates with the ball. When we talk about like, this value proposition, like, I was fortunate enough to go to the PGA show this year. It was the first time I ever was able to, to, to take off time to go do it. And it's amazing. Like You walk the show, and there's, I don't know how many apparel companies are at the show, but there's 400. Uh, you probably know more than I do. And of the 400, there's probably like 15 of them that are different, and then 385 are the same. They think they're different, right? They have the new logo, or they're, you know, they're tied into some old person who used to play golf, or something that's different. But you know, if you put them all together and you took a blind taste test, they're all relatively the same thing. And I think, you know, as we talk about golf courses, you know, there's 18 holes, there's 36 holes, there's grass, there's pins, there's cups, there's tee blocks, there's golf cars, there's views, there's scorecards, there's yardage books, there's sometimes caddies, there's not caddies. You know, there's all these things. But what really is the difference maker? And in your case, you started three, you know, the debatably very successful brands. You just started a new one, but at least all three of them were different. And and when you when you when you look at them and you think about them and you talk to people about them, they're, it's not the same. It's it's it's, it's something different. Kind of like how you talk about Ashworth resonating as a child. For us, I mean, our age group, that's what we grew up on. Uh, it, it's key. And that, that's been one of the biggest challenges when you. It's related back to a PJ professional. If you ran one facility for 10 years or one management group, and now you're over here in another management group in another property, it's just got to constantly reinvent yourself and look at your assets, look at the personnel you have, and figure out how you can leverage that and you know, what you have uniquely there within your space of you know, 30 mile proximity, I'm sure. Um, for us, each time we enter the market, it's again looking at every single brand that's out there, seeing what people are doing, seeing what contemporary the real world's doing like the same thing in fashion or, or golf is happening in fashion where um, people want more faster um, everyone's active on the go with our new brand Matt Gray and Heather Gray um, our slogan is life active um, with the other brands there's different things that we're tapping into but right now people young families um, guys in their 20s 30s to ante up and join a club when you're married with kids. It's, it's a challenging thing to do with the cost of living here in Southern California and whatnot. Um, so what can you do to make it more obtainable, more accessible, more uh, the <coughs> accessible, and also more family friend friendly so that um, it, it can keep everyone happy in, in the household. Um, I mean, even if you parlay in other businesses that we're familiar with, even peripheral to golf, you know, like golf carts, for example. You know, I mean, there's three major golf carts. There's Yamaha, Easy Go, and Club Cart. At the end of the day, really, what is the true di you know, difference between the three of them? Where does it really occur? Their advertising, where they're built, how they're delivered, how they're serviced, what they look like. I mean, it's pretty, pretty down the line, and it's identical. I mean, usually, usually the most successful companies deliver what they promise and have the best product <clears throat> or the strongest customer service. I mean, it's as simple as that. We talked a little bit about uh, this. This is a SWOT analysis. This kind of goes back into you know understanding who you are, what you are, and what your competitive set is all about. Hopefully, people are know what a SWOT analysis is. But Les, you want to give us a three-minute thing on SWOT analysis and why it might be important in this? Three minutes on SWOT. Two minutes and 59 seconds. About 30 seconds. And SWOT just stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So it's taking a look at your business from the inside out. So what are your strengths and how do I leverage those things? What are my weaknesses? And how do I shore those things up or navigate around them? You see, people are we're creatures of habit. 
So once we get to a certain age, we stop trying to get better at the things we're already good at, and we avoid the things that we suck at, like the plague. We just can't stand it. And then opportunities, where's our growth opportunity? Where are we gonna find new customers? And then the threats, who's coming into the marketplace that's gonna take us out? If he had a big old sack of cash, he'd be looking to take out people by building, what is it, uh, six, six, 12, and 18 old golf courses. So there might be somebody out there that's posing that. So it's just a, it's a, it's a methodology of taking your, and you have to be incredibly objective, and I think if you're going to really do a squat analysis session, you need to find some people that you know, that you like, and that you trust, that are more objective than you are about your business to ask those. <clears throat> Eric called me one time when he first met me, and he said that he, liked, he uh, called me a motivational speaker, and that's not true. I, nobody's ever paid me to motivate them. I'm more of an agitational or an irritational speaker, because I ask questions about, my client's business that they don't really like to have asked of them. Like, where's the hole in your game? Why do you do it that way? So if you're gonna do a squat, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, make sure that you're not uh, buying your own stuff. So I would encourage you to find somebody that's maybe even, have, one of the things that people value with my services, I don't specialize in any one industry or vertical. Um, it, it's career limiting to me. I've got one golf course client. Got one manufacturer that makes wheelchairs. I've got another one that makes thermal plastics. So they hire me for my objectivity. So I'll come in and I'll start poking holes, and flipping over rocks. So that's really the benefit of SWOT analysis: is really knowing where you're strong and how strong you really are, and just as importantly, where the holes are. Yeah, you have to be super honest. As a sociologist, the one person who I think would probably be really bad at doing a SWOT analysis would be Donald Trump, right? If you've ever heard him talk about one of his properties or his companies, he's absolutely unequivocally the best, or they're the best that have ever been that walked the earth, that have breathed his oxygen, and all the competition stuff. I mean, do you think his SWOT analysis would be pretty interesting to read? It, it, would, it would just be a, a like a picture of him. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at all he needs, S W O T. So there's a picture of him. In the consumer side, there's two really quick ways that you can do a SWOT analysis of your business. One is to hire a mystery shopping company. They'll tell you the truth. And it's the best money you will ever spend. Another way to do it is, when was the last time any of you ever called your own course the way you want your customers to? What's that experience like? I see a lot of heads now nodding. Thank you for calling ABC Golf Course. Your call is important to us. Please listen carefully as our options have changed. You don't call that number, you call the secret bat line number that nobody else has. You call your pros' uh, cell phone. But you want to be humble, secret shop yourself. Or hire a firm to secret shop yourself. The, the question that I was Horribly humble. Ask, Life is humbling. The question that I was going to ask uh, in regards to the SWOT analysis, for somebody who's going to go through it for the first time, do you spend more time focusing on improving your weaknesses or, or you know, correcting your weaknesses? or strengthening your strengths? Like how do you decide where to start? I think the, the things that you really identify that you're strongest at, you gotta make sure that those don't wind up becoming irrelevant. And again, that's why humility and objectivity are so important because just because you think it's a strength, it's really not that relevant unless somebody else thinks it, the end user thinks it's a strength. So I think that you protect your strengths and fine tune those things, but if they're already part of your DNA, I think you're golden. And then I think when the weaknesses come down, if you find four or five of them, if you try and focus on all of them, you'll focus on none of them. It's like the dog who tried to catch all the rabbits. Focus on the one weakness that's gonna have the single biggest impact on your business and create mastery around that and then move on to the next one. Is it, is it a good time to ask your customers through you know, an audit or a survey as Chris was showing earlier that Trim does, is it a good time to ask them deep questions before you do the SWOT analysis or after the SWOT analysis? I don't know. I, I, I really don't can't answer that question. I think it's a great process and, and you know, the voice of the customer. It needs to be part of the process. I don't know that there's really that much relevance to when you do the SWOT analysis. I think it's all part and parcel of it. But again, it, the single biggest piece of advice I can give anybody, and I don't own a mystery shopping company, so I'm not peddling one, but I use one. I have a colleague of mine that I, before I started working with OB Sports, when I got a, an invitation to sit across the table and talk to them about their business, I had my guy shop six of their properties because I want to know what I was getting into. And you were one of them. We did awesome. Kick butt. We failed miserably. We tried hard, though. I mean, at the end of the day, I got to tell my guy, you tried. Yeah. 
but we, as a group, we failed because we didn't do anything different than the rest. We just were normal. Right. And the whole the whole proposition was to be abnormal. But to answer Chris your question, and maybe it suggests an idea like when I look at property, like my property, the properties that I've worked at, one of the things I do is when I do my SWOT analysis, I take a look at the competition, I take a look at ourselves, we look really hard internally and externally, but really hard internally. We try to figure out um, what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong, and then we do the same thing at these other properties. And once I identify, say, what my competitive set is doing right, I try to learn what they're doing and try to improve upon those items. And then I try to figure out what they're doing wrong if I can, and then try to make sure I don't repeat their mistakes or I don't um, fall down that same kind of tricky path. And we put on here uh, management companies and facility marketing partnerships. We'll talk a little about that. But Yelp, Greenskeeper.org, and TripAdvisor. I'm assuming everybody's familiar with these three resources. But they are essentially secret shoppers. The guy from Yelp, the guy from Greenskeeper.org, and the guy from TripAdvisor, or the female, when they come to your property, they're not telling you ahead of time they're coming in. But the people who participate on those three social media websites are hyper crazy. That's how I would describe it. They're hypercritical. They're going to tell you what you do great, and they're going to tell you what you do wrong. They're also going to tell everybody else who's reading this, these formats. But the neat thing about it is, if I want to see what Pelican Hill's up to, if I want to see what you know, you're doing over at Tufts Ranch, I'm going to read your Yelp program, your greenskeeper.org feedback, and your trip advisor. And they date them. You know, they put a time, a date, like a picture. They, have, they rate these people if they're confident enough. And you're going to get the most honest feedback you'll ever get. I mean, and think about how that affects our marketplace and marketing and branding. And that's what we talked about, manager company, facility marketing partnerships, and then these three guys. I mean, you can control your brand message, and you can control your staff, and you can even try to direct some of these other folks. But then you better hope that your management company is in the same boat. I mean, what if one day they walk up and they tell you you got to do something different that goes completely against your branding message or your facility marketing partnerships? I mean, sometimes you can piggyback off of someone else's success and be partnered with it in a positive way. You know, it could be Omega, like with the PGA Tour or the PGA of America with Omega. Um, it could be, um, you know, the people that made the mistake of uh, 10, 15 years ago in, in Corona with the, you know, the, the, the event they had, the tents. You know, look at that, how that affected their reputation for life. It, it can make a big difference. Trash, you good with your three topics or you want to talk more about yourself? Okay. Chris, tell us just a little bit about the companies you work with and how this plays into what you've done. Well, we're lucky enough to work with a, a number of companies, again, in a number of different sectors, but you know, regarding SWOT analysis and asking hard questions and secret shopping, I mean, we just spent five minutes talking about this. We work with 24 different food brands. Some of them were created in the mid-1800s. Before we started working with these food brands, I have a team of 12. Before we started to work with the food brands, we actually tried the food. Right? So, so we, we, were, we work with Underwood meat spread. Has anybody ever had Underwood meat spread? It's pretty tasty. It's a little bit like Spam, tuna, salt, and water. You mix it all up, you put it on Melba Toast. We tried it because we wanted to understand what people were saying about it online so we could have a baseline. You know, did it deserve the reputation that it did? Uh, we love Underwood. It's a very interesting brand to try to market. You know, we market cream of wheat. We market uh, Mrs. Dash, so really stalwart brands in their respective categories. We market MSG. Is there a single person out there that likes MSG? Technically speaking, yes. <laughs> Can any of you say something positive about MSG? <laughs> My company it has been you know, has been employed to try to market MSG online. So, so take Yelp and Greenkeeper.org and TripAdvisor and all the rest of social media and try to think, hey, how would you market MSG? How do you say something positive about a brand that has so many negative connotations? And, and quite honestly. You do the best you can to mitigate risk. You start there. You be honest with yourself in the SWOT analysis. And you do try to find advocates. Because no matter what it is you market, no matter what it is you try to sell, you are going to find people who are going to actually advocate your 
brand, your product. And we found that there was a niche. It was southern cooking around fried okra, fried chicken. So we reached out to bloggers that were in that market and we provided them some product and we created some recipes with them and we shared those recipes. Has anybody ever heard of Pinterest? Yeah? How many of you are on Pinterest? <coughs> right back, I like it. So there's three of you on Pinterest, right? So you take MSG, Southern Fried Chicken, and Pinterest, and what do you get? We put one recipe on Pinterest and it has since been shared 22,000 times. We didn't do anything except put the recipe on Pinterest. So we kind of picked and chose what it was that we could we could manage, we you know, kind of stayed out of our own way. Uh, Eric put up swimspot.com as one of the brands that we work with. About four and a half years ago, we launched swimspot.com in collaboration with Raj Manufacturing, which is the leading women's swim manufacturer in the United States. So Raj Manufacturing <coughs> sells swimwear, sells it to big retailers and small retailers, B2B. But we were brought on to help launch the B2C. So you can imagine, okay, women's swimwear, all right, it's a commodity for the most part. They make amazing swimwear. Everybody, please pass that on if you know the falls, the family. But it is a commodity. So how do you then, online, differentiate yourself from companies like Amazon, and Zappos, and Nordstrom, and Macy's, and Dillard's, and Kohl's, right? You're just little bitty swimspot.com. So how do you differentiate yourself? We're too new to have a SWOT analysis. So what we did, is we dug deep and we thought through, well, how can we be different? How can we create a conversation around something that differentiates, differentiates us from people who've been in the business for 50, 60 years? We created the Fit Specialist Program. And what we do is we hire people who have gone to school at FIM, Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising, and we hire people who've been in retail for 10, 15 years and really get it. And we train them up so they know how to absolutely fit women to wear a swimwear that when they buy it and wear it, they're going to feel great showing it off. <coughs> and we train it up and then we market that we've got this great service. We make sure that it's integrated across all of our direct channels, social channels, affiliate channels, print channels, TV channels. And so we just make sure that everything reinforces this key program. We train our staff. We make sure they understand the value proposition so that they share it. Heck, when we were building and launching the website, we trained, we trained my mother so that she understood how to use it so she could speak to it. But we made sure that there was some continuity in messaging. Perfect. I don't know exactly how the slide system works, but <coughs> that's usually you to stop talking. The, uh, this is, uh, I stole this uh, quote from somebody else, which is kind of ironic. Why create something new when you can just use that effort to make something already successful better? I think, uh, I don't know, I think it's somebody you might know. Uh, better understanding the current landscape, stealing and sharing ideas from others. How about other industries? Obviously, we've had an opportunity now to talk a little bit about um, some other industries that are peripheral to golf and even outside of golf. Chris, thank you for sharing that story about meat spread. I think you guys, Chris actually brought a couple of cases of it today. You guys are going to be able to sample that at lunch today. <laughs> I, isn't it the game of venison? Isn't that the one that's really tasty? No, that's right. <laughs> Rice look and smoke. But no, on, on the Underwood Meat Spread's website, they have, uh, they have a section of their site uh, for disaster preparation. So if you ever wonder kind of, you know, what to put into the shelter, Underwood. <laughs> underwood meat, that's like been on the moon, yeah. been in a cabin, underwood, the underwood meat. that was his last official meal, as a poet. Hi, <laughs> right, general practices, this is going to skip through this because I think we've talked about it a lot already, but consistent branding and messaging, obviously the, the word consistent is used a lot. Um, if you get something good, be consistent with it and make sure it keeps you know, spreading the word. Collateral, the sense that if you, you know, your consistent branding and messaging needs to follow through towards your collateral to your website and with your ad, ad, advertisements. Um, any major company that's worth its weight in salt does this one down pat pretty good. And the only time you probably will ever see them change this is when it's pretty dramatic and they're gonna introduce a new product line or you know change course, but they do it in a manner that they want you to know about it. Um, I'm sure that we can all think of some examples, but 
usually it's pretty pretty steady, pretty moving forward, and then they change their logo and change their direction, all of a sudden there's something way, way different. Um, consistent communication. Again, you know, marketing is a form of communication, but this is kind of fine-tuning a little bit. You know, your press releases, your newsletters, your email blasts, you know, internal and external communication has to be very consistent. Um, I was able to work for the Irvine Company for three years for Mr. Freelander, and this was something that we did an excellent job at. I mean, everything that ever was sent out uh, via communication to internally or externally was always done the same exact way and always had the same type of messaging. I'm sure that hopefully the PGA of America is that way, where you would be uh, But it makes a difference. I mean, especially if you want your frontline employees to speak up the same messaging that you do. If you want your salespeople to speak up the same messaging that your brand promises. And if you want your owners and your managers and everybody, your guests, to think the same way you do and to speak of you in the same manner, this has to be very consistent and at the body. How to promote your brand? Exciting. The reason I play this game is I want to win and I want to be in contention. I perceive my eyewear as my equipment, and if I want to go perform and play golf for a living, I want the best equipment for my eyes. As pros, we want to win, and we want to make sure that we continue to win. I can see all the lines. I can see the contours on the greens, the color definition. When I'm in situations that demand a good read, I don't have to question my eyes. Sunny. Body, rainy, I can wear it in all conditions because that's what I experience on tour. To me, it's proof. It's not like I'm hoping it works. It does work. Why do I wear Oakley Iron? It is engineered for the game of golf. It's not hard to tell what they're trying to hold on to. Winning, being number one, you know, just being the best. Engineering the way to play the game of golf. Getting the message out. What real life examples are there of who has done it right? Be it Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all forms of traditional media. Panel, anybody do this stuff right? <laughs> There's a lot of people who do it wrong. Are there any questions in the audience right now? Uh, there's a company right now that I just want to highlight that's done a great job over the last two years establishing a brand, primarily through social media and what's referred to as earned media. So thus they didn't pay for it. Paid media and buy earned media. There's a company called Warby Parker. Has anybody ever heard of Warby Parker? There's three of you. Okay, they probably need to start marketing better. There's only three of you heard of them. But Warby Parker, they make and they sell sunglasses and eyewear, so prescription eyewear. But they don't sell it through lens crafters, they, they don't sell it through third-party distributors and retailers. They sell it direct to the consumer. And they are very focused on what they do. They only sell eyeglasses. So two years ago, they established what was this platform that they were going to sell direct. They designed and manufactured great eyeglasses. They sell them for 15 to 30% less than what you could buy out of retail you know, at, at retail, and their customer service is outstanding. And how do I know about that? Because I saw and heard and read it, read about it on social media. So whether it was Facebook or on Twitter, you know, whether, I, whether I read about it on a blog or whether it was a trade publication, they generated a solid groundswell of earned media. Now I've recently seen where they've placed uh, some paid advertising on TV, but that's only because, one, they got an investment in capital, but they, you know, they're looking to scale on the global level. But Warby Parker has done an awesome job of creating and, and establishing a brand that's believable. Their products are amazing. Their customer service is spot on. The way they deliver the packages to you, the way they handle returns, the way they talk to you on the phone, everything is integrated. There's no confusion. If you go to their Facebook page, their Twitter account, their website, Everything lives, breathes, and sleeps Warby Parker. So that's a great case study for somebody that's going out there, whether it's Matt Gray or you know any other company that is wanting to try to establish a, a brand and, and try to find a niche. I and mean, that's something that they did too. They did a SWOT analysis of a category, and they've now decided to you know, be the leader in a sector that there were no other competitors. And nobody has stepped up either. So they got a two-year head start 
on anybody else that wants to try to replicate their model. There's a case study. Is that Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, the first one in the world? Wasn't that his famous line? I wish I was his roommate in college. That's all I can say. You'd be in a movie. Yes, Mr. Warren. For any of you, especially Chris, uh, what what metric do you use to track social media? I know we've looked at a couple of different ones. What's the most successful metric you think for uh, tracking social media? Share a voice, or what, what do y'all use? Yeah, I mean, for, for me and my clients, I mean, we track it all the way down to business to the, the website and conversion. So for us, it's transaction. Now, not every business is the same, but let's use Eric's property for, for example. Yeah, so he's got a Facebook page and he's going to throw up a promotion that's you know, come on, you know, come, come to the, click this link, come to our website and book a tea time. And what we're able to do is to track how many people <coughs> click through the link. How many people, you know, what their, the time they spent on the website, what percentage of those people that visited the website converted, to whether it was book a tea time or sign up for the newsletter. So now you've got metrics, you know, conversion metrics. Uh, you know, for us, that's where we start. And then on a, you know, on a way, way back on a, on a very simple level, you know, does, does somebody like it? Does somebody share it? Share a voice is key. Sentimentality is key, but did it drive sales? Start, stop there first. Yeah, there's a big debate with social media. It's, you know, it's still new. It's still ever changing. You know, today's Twitter could be something. You know, what's up next year? So, um, as a guy who has bought marketing and, and hired somebody like Chris or and gotten advice from Chris Strauss about social media, for us it was always like a value proposition. I mean. How much money are you going to put into it? What can you really get out of it? You know, is it really worth what time? And then how can it positively and negatively affect you? And we'll talk a bit about that moving forward. But I think we are finally, to at least in my opinion, we're finally at a, at a place where you're starting to see some really driven metric response to some of this, where you actually can prove the value of it. I mean, I've sat around in the room and debated whether or not market should have a market. Like, you should just not spend money on market. You would just hire sales people. Um, you know, that's one thing. Or you take all that money and build yourself a six by six by six golf course. I mean, what really drives the needle or pushes the needle? I finally think that social media is making a difference. So there's just one point that I want to make that you know a lot of people try to create a Facebook page or a Twitter account or whatnot. They're, the metric they pay the most attention to is how many people like me, follow me. That really is a very superfluous metric. It shouldn't be how many, it's who, right? So if you had a million followers or a million fans and only, you know, a hundred of them spent a hundred dollars, wouldn't it be way better if you had one fan that spent a thousand dollars and told 500 of their friends that then spent $50? You, you really are looking for advocates. You're not looking for the grand. You're looking for the best. Um, we'd like to introduce uh, have Brett Darrow I'll talk a little bit right now about some of the technology. I know when we talked about this topic, the topic expanded to branding, which gave us enough topic space to talk for two and a half hours. But initially it was talked about was this kind of dichotomy between discounting and added value and um, yield management and you know, sort of this new trend there are, at least with the public golf courses, um, with the, you know, where we were like in 2006 and 7 and 8, we started to really have some great numbers. It's a lot of rounds and a lot of productivity. The economy went kind of south. Um, you know, we all kind of started batting down the hatches and making a lot of operational cuts. And then all of a sudden, a few of these discount type operations, and we're not here to talk negatively about anybody because they're all positive and negative depending on how you look at it. Um, but we wanted to talk a little bit about Brett, what you bring to the table and how you're new age. Because unlike um, somebody like me who can sell something, or these guys who can market something with social media, you're now the future. You represent technology and how that plays into what we could and cannot do. And why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do and why it's important? Um, I think really in regards to uh, technology, it's really just embracing it um, and not be scared of it. Uh, we're talking about marketing and branding and whatnot and building what 
I would say all of that is to really, in essence, build up your database and understand who your customer is, how often do they play, um, who is that customer, in essence. Um, and you really have to have solutions that will absolutely um, give you that data, right? So you need to know what that data is. Um, how, how many times has a customer played my facility and not played in the last you know, 30 days, 60 days, 12 months? We talk about participation a lot here uh, as it's declining, but what about that customer that has played my facility six, six months ago, but I had no idea and I haven't reached out to them yet, right? Um, when I do email marketing, am I email marketing to the masses or am I really targeting my customer database and trying to figure out the, my best customer how to get him back? If my offer is for Thursday afternoon specials, right, and I've got a guy that's never played on Thursday afternoons and we know, you know him, why are we even sending him the email, in essence, right? It's really trying to figure out um, that customer, who's your best customer, how to attract them and get them to play more at your facility. And it's all about your brand. It's all about your facility and understanding that customer. It goes to that social media side of the equation as well, which is just, I don't care if you have a million subscribers or a million fans, right? I really just need a hundred that really make a difference. Because if a million ever engage, I don't really care. Um, so for us, it's all about really understanding your customer and trying to market to them. And as you guys and use these experts that are you know, marketers in essence, because I'm not a marketer, I can build the technology, I can build the solutions, and I can think outside the box of what it needs to do for you. Um, but as you build that database up, having the technology that actually can digest all of this information and then push out to get somebody to come back and ultimately play your facility more. Right? It's about driving rounds and revenue for your facility through your brand direct. That's really what we're all about. And so just really understanding that piece of it. Um, and you know, just again, going back to just the, the customer and the experience, right? We wanna make sure that when they're making a tea time reservation, they're booking a tea time or they wanna get on your facility, make it simple and easy. Do not make it complicated. If you go to your website, make it easy to book a tea time. It's kind of the same analogy over here as a call in the facility. When you call, what do I have to go through to get to the actual reservation and make a tea time reservation? We want to make that process fast and simple. We want to do that same thing online, mobile, whatever that is. We just want to make sure we're always in front of it. If that's through Facebook or if that's through Twitter or if that's through the web or if that's through mobile, you just want to make sure your facility is in front of them with a very simple, easy tool to do. Perfect. Now, Brett, you have two distinctive things that, are, that our company utilizes. There's the drive, yeah. which is a uh, kind of a marketing tool, and then you also have your utilization, your yield management tool. Can you speak? Sure. Both of those. Um, so there's two, two pieces. One, uh, we'll talk about the yield for a second, maybe. Um, because discounting, every time talks about discounting in the golf industry. I just asked the question, what is discounting? Because to me, golf and tea times, there is such a significant price difference between Saturday morning at 10 a.m. and Thursday at 4 p.m., right? And there's a complete difference in your price there and value there. But is that discount? I don't think that's discounting in that sense. It's just finding the best price for a time that is not in high demand in essence, right? Now, discounting is 10 o'clock Saturday morning, and I'm going to drop this thing down to 50%. Yeah, that would certainly be discount. Uh, but I don't think we are doing that in this industry, quite honestly. I mean, maybe some are, uh, but I would say they're probably the ones that are going out of business or closing the doors. Um, so utilization is really, in my mind, it's really pricing tea time inventory based on demand. Um, and where is that demand? So as the demand increases, the price can go up. Um, and creating that understanding of the consumer so they understand the value of that. You guys make your money on those Saturday times. I mean, that's where you really need to push the envelope. I don't think the industry really understands yet how many customers were turning away on a Saturday morning, right? Somebody calls in or they go to the website and they want to play on Saturday morning, there's no availability, right? How much opportunity did we leave on the table because we didn't push the rate on that price? So I think demand pricing is a big component. We, at one club I was working at, we actually counted the number of calls Call for a tea time on Friday of Thanksgiving. Because in theory, we all consider the Friday of Thanksgiving one of, if not the busiest day of the year. Now, it's not the most profitable day of the year because it's after daylight savings. So 
so there's a shorter amount of inventory that we can sell. But in the, the essence of busy, I think we tracked it based on the volume of calls. And on that particular day, we got we could have sold the T-sheet two and a half times. So you know, when we're trying to take advantage of, of Brett, he's helping us at Modern Beach, um, we're trying to really embrace the, the airline, the hotel, the car rental business model, where if the demand is there, then we're going to charge a demand price. And if the demand isn't there, we're going to not offer a discounted price. We're just going to charge the fair price. Because we feel like there is some flexibility between those those points. Um, we can prove it. We can prove it through all the statistical analysis that we've conducted over the last 20 years in our marketplace. We can do it by just looking at last week. We can do it by looking at yesterday. So we're going to be, we're going to try to be one of the people who actually embrace it. And we're willing to take it on the chin a few times. If somebody calls and says, what's the rate on this day? We might say 150. And on the next day, we might say 300. They might think we're, you know, we're talking about singles and doubles. Or, and we're just, we're really going to try to take it on the chin and, and teach people that there's now a new way to do business. Yeah, definitely. I think you don't really have to have that big of swings, but <coughs> you can have a swing, I think, in, in regards to $20. Fairly easy. Um, at any point, um, we've got a, an executive nine hole facility in Phoenix, Arizona that's been demanding for the last three years. And, um, had to educate the customer in regards to that piece, but it's not a hard education, which is they understand fundamentally what's going on in regards to supply and demand, and they see it across the board. I mean, actually, it's really interesting in regards to what like Amazon's doing now. I've seen Amazon's pricing, they're dynamically pricing diapers, okay, because they can, because they know when the price and when the demand is actually there in regards to shopping for diapers. So they are just tweaking the model just a little bit and that's where it's going, and that's where certainly I think tea times and, and golf would certainly go. How does Amazon know I've ran out of diapers? They don't necessarily know that, but they just analyze their data, and they know when diapers are in higher demand, in essence, in regards to shopping. If it's Sunday afternoons when women are looking for that, I don't know exactly, but they know from the historical data in regards to the traffic that they're receiving in regards to shopping for diapers, when they can push the price or push it. I think they can smell my house through the mouth. <laughs> well, the, one, the one thing that Amazon does do is they, they're they a huge big data company, but they drill the data into the first. So they know that we need diapers because we order diapers through Amazon, and they figure that every two weeks we're going to order more diapers. But thus, And that's where the technology really comes into play, right? It's not being scared of the technology. It's really looking at it and saying, this is a solution for me to better understand my business, my customer, and ultimately make me more money. Your, well, your data and your database, out, you know, arguably, are the two greatest resources that you have outside of how well your greenskeeper keeps your golf course for you. Question? I have a question. I'm at a property that's a resort, and we changed the green fee for Twilight, you know, to give a, a discount to the resort guests. But we also have a private membership, and it doesn't matter uh, what time of day it is, it's the same green fee all day long. Is anybody in a private club done like a twilight rate for a guest fee? Have you had any success with that? Or is anybody ever tried that? I don't know what specifically with privates very often. Um, I can certainly talk to my own habits, and this is one thing that I, I do belong to a club. This drives me crazy in regards to this kind of growing the game scenario. Um, my son, 15-year-old son, just starting to play a little bit and get out there and play, and he's got a buddy that's uh, is into the game a little bit as well. And my guest fee for him to come to bring his buddy there is still the same guest fee as if I brought someone, you know, 125 bucks. And it's just like, that's just insane. That's crazy. I've got two kids that are just trying to get introduced to the game. And I've got, and they play maybe nine holes. Maybe they play nine holes, right? But I still have to pay the same guest fee. So um, if it's not out there, I would suggest you certainly should offer something like that. Here's Scott. Where's Scott Hine? Scott Hine and Todd Heaver, you guys are proud speakers. I mean, Todd, I know you've been running PJ West now for several years, and, and Scott, you just took over Oakmont Country Club from a from a public background. I mean, what have you noticed? I mean, I would have to imagine, like with you, Scott, you went into a club that had been set in its way for many years and probably hadn't thought outside the box since the box was made. Am I right? <laughs> pretty close. Pretty close. Yeah. They, uh, That's the reason you got hired. They've, they've, they've avoided change and. Thankfully, now they're embracing some of it. But, uh, yeah, I think all the, the, the questions you just asked is stuff that we're all looking at is, 
even on the private side, we're trying to maximize yield management. And, you know, that's an everyday occurrence on the public side. Um, but on the private side, you know, we still have downtime and, and we still, and we have overuse of other times. So how do we move people from where, where that high demand is Saturday morning and get them to the, to the shoulder time to do those things? Um, so it, it ac actually crosses over very well, um, you know, changing uh, guest fees at a certain time, giving them a reason to move to that point. Um, maybe it's money or maybe it's a added value or maybe whatever it is, you know, uh, maybe it's, you know, carts are included if you bring guests at this time, but you pay extra here. I mean, some, some way to, to get people to play where you want them to play. Um, whether it's public or private, I think that's what this whole thing's about. Because we have this window every day of, of daylight, and once it closes, you can't get it back. It's all about the yield. I mean, the, those who can tackle the yield correctly probably are going to be the most profitable group. And, and the big benefit of all this too is goes back to what Chris talked about in the beginning, which is that you know people want to play faster, right? They want to have more fun. Well, if we spread everybody out evenly, we have a nice day. Right. But everybody comes out and. I'm as guilty as anybody, and I stick, Mark might say, a bunch of squeeze times in there at 9 a.m. on Saturday, I piss everybody off, you know? So this this, this is really the way to, to maximize revenue, rounds, numbers of guests that see your facility and raise the level of their, their happiness during their experience. Todd, how about you at the beautiful, majestic PGA West? Best <laughs> bacon. <laughs> Somewhat uh, similar in terms of whether there's classifications that you end up wanting to get out uh, to play and offer them. So we do that uh, uh, to get off to the side. We, we actually noticed that it was an increase in rounds by having a little bit of a twilight rate, if you will, uh, that actually was, was quite dramatic. And obviously, it's something that they never benefit. Uh, but it got more people out to play golf, and it's certainly a lot of the programming later in the day uh, helps kind of take, take care of those gaps as well. But, uh, yeah, the discounting, the discounting did actually increase rate rounds and it increased the around the club. You know, maybe even you don't have to discount, maybe you throw in a clinic at 2 o'clock if uh, people come out for a half hour clinic and go over to their teaching. And, you know, maybe that's enough to push the needle just ever so slightly to help everybody out. All right, one, one point I would say on that yield that we've noticed as well, um, we basically yield by the hour, but the system yields by the hour. The key to this all, too, is that it's automated, right? The fact that you don't have to do anything um, is the big piece, right? So you have to automate this whole process. Again, embracing the technology and the solution so that it's not something that you guys have to manually do. Um, and but what we're seeing is we're actually, we are seeing that spreading out of the T-sheet. So we see at 9 a.m. and you have you know only a foursome left, that price might be, and I'm just throwing out a price, $100, right? Um, but at 10 o'clock, at 10 to 15, maybe you can play and it's 95, right, or it's 90 because there's more supply in that 10 o'clock hour. And so you're starting to see people spread out throughout that T-shirt, which is just going to increase that whole pace of play scenario. Um, and so that's really a big key to this whole utilization component, pricing based on demand, is you are seeing the spreading out of the T-shirt. It's definitely working. Any questions for Brett and any of this technology? It's some interesting stuff, and if you are interested, I know Brett would love to follow up with you, but um, you know, our company as a whole has embraced it, and I'm sure other management companies are going to start embracing it. Um, you know, who knows, five, ten years from now, the, the whole model, the way we charge for daily fee and public and municipal golf could be different, and it's people like Brett and Chris Strauss who are pushing the needle, and at the end of the day, if we actually start making more money, you know, if we don't if we don't actually deflate the number of people playing, then maybe we'll see salaries go up, and we'll see some positives that uh, that we can control, and not blame others for not helping us out even more. Discounting was added value, and old-fashioned way through a solid sales effort and execution. <laughs> Last one. I'm on that cleanup. Boom, boom. So I wanted to start off by talking about, we've been talking about marketing since this thing started. Marketing and sales, I think unfairly gets lumped together. Um, no offense to my colleague here, but I remember when I first met him, he said, I'm the director, vice president of marketing and sales. And I asked the question, I said, do you think those are the same thing? And I get this response a lot is, yeah, marketing and sales, there's kind of a fuzzy line between the two of them. And that may be true in retail, it may be true on the consumer end. But if you really want to make money and you really want to move the dial, in my opinion, sales and marketing needs to be separate a little bit because they're different animals. 
And the way I do, I'm a sales guy, so I'm going to be really brief, as a joke, and I'm going to be simple. I'm going to keep this simple for you. I think, it, from my point of view, marketing makes a promise. You go out, you build your brand, you make a promise. And you're in the experience business, right? You're, you're not selling rounds of golf, you're selling experiences. So you make this promise, and then it's the sales job, or the person in the sales organization, or the person that's customer facing, to deliver on the promise, to actually execute. And everything that that salesperson does, or everything that they don't do, is either going to make you a liar or make you a hero. So I think that it's important to understand that. We've been talking about all these different things in marketing. So, so now what? So you marketed the hell out of your business, you built your brand, you've uh, optimized your website for search engine, you've got your social media platforms all up and running, you've got a couple of cool hashtags, you're tweeting, whatever that means, you're doing all that stuff. And all in an effort to get the phone to ring. All in an effort to get somebody to walk through your front door. And as Chris alluded to earlier in the morning, if the, the very next thing that happens, the first person that touches the guest, the first person that answers the phone when somebody's actually been drawn in, they're taking action on your call to action, now becomes part of your brain. There's a really old expression that says, your action speaks so loud I can't hear a word you're saying. And the same is true with marketing and sales. So, and I'll prove it to you really quickly. I do a lot of customer service training, and I'll ask the group two questions. Actually, it's four. And here's the first question. So I want you to think for just a minute about a company that you love to do business with. And I'll ask for volunteers, and I get some ums and some ahs, and somebody will say, well, Nordstrom's. And I'll say, why? And they go, well, they're easy to do business with. They make me feel good. And those are all pretty good answers, right? They're, but they're vague, wandering generalities. They're warm and fuzzy. So then I'll turn around and I'll ask this question, and I'll ask it of you. Think for just a second about a company that you absolutely hate to do business with. There's heads nodding, names AT&T, Dish Network, for me it's United. They pop into our head. And think about those, those are heavy hitters. Like, I don't like AT&T, I'm not a big fan of Dish Network, and I'm not, I, I, I hate United, I've flown for years. I travel 200,000 miles domestically every year, and I hate United. And I'm trying to think, I don't think United has ever marketed themselves as being a crappy company. They never sloganed themselves by saying, fly with us, give us our money, because we suck. The reason that I think they suck is because the people on the other side of the experience are driving that, right? The same is true in your business. So marketing makes the promise and sales executes. Quick show of hands, how many of you in the room are in sales? Very nice. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, how many of you uh, that didn't raise your hand are customer facing, you actually interact with your guest? A few more? You're in sales too. Anybody uh, uh, have to convince somebody to part with a resource or to get them to do something that they might not otherwise want to do? You're in sales. We're all in sales. My point is, is that every single person in the four walls of your organization is in sales and everything that they do makes your brand either a liar or a hero. It's, it's that simple. And you realize that when you go out of your way and spend the money, all the things that we're talking about, some of it's earned, some of it's bought, but even the stuff that's earned is really not free because it requires energy and effort and time, and that stuff all costs money. So I've worked with organizations that will pay us a, a low end of six or seven dollars per phone call, just six bucks. Every time the phone rings with an inbound opportunity, it costs them six bucks. I've worked with other companies that is upwards of $200 to get the phone to ring. Now here's the stat. Every single inbound lead that you capture, you have the uh, likelihood, a 95% chance of converting that to a revenue producing event, 95%. Is there anyone in the room that can boast a 95% conversion ratio? Probably not. So where does it fall apart? It, you could argue it may have fallen apart by price. I would always argue that it's gonna fall apart because of the person at the other end of the phone. I'll share a quick story with you about branding. I was in the market to buy a wedding about two years ago, and one of the venues that I looked at was the Ritz-Carlton. Everybody in the room is familiar with her. Anybody never heard of the Ritz-Carlton? Many of you probably stayed at Ritz-Carlton. I'm not gonna name the name of the city that this particular property was in, New Orleans. But I called. Hey now. But I called the Ritz Carlton, I'm, I'm a player. I'm gonna have a small wedding, I've got the money, I know how much it's gonna cost, more or less, I just want more information. And I kind of, so all their marketing, all their branding, all that stuff, I call and I, and I get this. Thank you for calling the Ritz Carlton. Please listen carefully, does that sound familiar? So now I gotta go through their voicemail gun. I'm a buyer, 
and I'm making it hard for me to give them my money. So I, I get all the way down to the catering sales director and I leave this woman a message. By the way, I know her. I've met her socially. I leave her a message. She knows I'm in play. She knows I'm not a poser. Three weeks go by. I make three more attempts to contact the Ritz-Carlton. Never got a call back. Sent an email. Never got an email back. So what do you think my perception of the Ritz-Carlton is now? They're drawn because of Mardi Gras? Yeah, that might be the case. That might be the case. I actually ran into the catering sales director a couple months afterwards at a social function, and I said, hey, I'm just curious. I, I left it. She goes, oh, my assistant never called you back? I went, no, she didn't. I didn't leave a message for your assistant. I left a message for you. So that's just the stuff that we capture. What about the stuff that we miss because we've got an automated attendant or because it's, we put them on hold too long? So everybody that touches your guest, your buyer, your prospect, becomes an extension of your brand. And if they're not singing from the same songbook, you're never going to close that business. You're never going to get the 95%. So everybody's in sales. How you answer the phone, how you treat your guests, how you respond, your turnaround time, all that stuff speaks more about your brand than all your fancy marketing, your slick ad campaigns, everything combined. Okay? You guys do an awesome job at Monarch Beach. Awesome job. You've got great marketing, but it's really about the experience. That's what sells the brand. So if you're going to focus on something, make sure you get that right first. So I want to, I know we're running a little long, I want to jump into the, the more uh, big ticket items. So I, I know many of you are trying to sell more than just rounds of golf, that's your bread and butter, but if you really want to put gravy on top of the steak, you're, you're talking about events, special events, tournaments, banquets, weddings, those types of things. There's some serious money to be had in that. How many of you have uh, dedicated sales professionals at your properties? Fair number of you. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to tell you their single biggest dysfunction. And I've only met one of them. I've met Eric. So they're solid cats. They're very solid cats. But I go on, hunt, I meet and work with hundreds of sales professionals, and I go on thousands of sales calls a year, and I can tell you unequivocally the number one area of dysfunction with a dedicated sales profession, professional is follow-up. F you. Follow-up. They suck at it. They suck at loud. So... There's a couple of things that I want to share with you that you can take back to your property about improving follow. If you want to close more business, you want to close more business, start focusing on the people that are already in the four walls of your organization. Focus on the people that are reaching out to you and capture that. 95% conversion ratio is a pretty big deal. So here's a couple of rules around follow. The very first rule you need to understand around follow from a sales professional's point of view, it's not the customer's job to follow up with you. I reached out to the Ritz-Carlton three times. That's not my freaking job. I don't buy weddings for a living. They sell them for a living. So it's her job to follow up with me. But you know why salespeople don't like following up with people? I call them one-hit wonders. 48% of sales professionals will make one attempt to follow up with an inquiry, and then they quit. Almost half. 48%. 25% will make two attempts, and then they'll throw in the towel. 12% will try three times and then they'll quit. Less than 6% of sales professionals will make more than four efforts or four attempts to connect with somebody once they get into the sales and they, they walk onto the lot. When you say jump ball, so when you lose, I ask this question all the time, when you lose, why do you lose? And all the time I get the same answer, it's price. I doubt it. I think the reason that we lose when we lose is because somebody else out hustled us, they outsold us. Nobody woke up this morning and said, I want to buy cheap crap. So don't tell me you lost by price. It's follow -up. So number one rule, it's not the customer's job. The second rule, I've already shared this with you, is how you follow up as a sales professional speaks more about your brand than all your marketing combined. It's the action that they're interested in. Does uh, everybody know who Tony Shea is? He's the uh, founder and CEO of uh, Zappos, right? He's credited with saying a couple of things. And one of the things that he said that I really like is, is customers and people, they'll forget what you said. They'll forgive what you did, but they'll never, ever forget how you made them feel. So if I'm a buyer, and I'm looking to buy a wedding, or I'm looking to buy a golf tournament, and I reach out to your club, and I want more information, you marketed to me. You started it with Twitter and Facebook and your website and your e-blast. You started it. So now I'm a buyer. I'm going to pick up the phone. Whose job is it to finish? Mine? No, it's yours. But see, sales professionals, they don't like doing that. They, they, they go, I don't want to be what? I don't want to be too pushy, right? But you just push them to the competitor. 
So I'll share with you three quick strategies and then I'll wrap this up. There's three tactics rather. I, I think of marketing as a strategy and sales as the tactic, right? So take this back to your salespeople as it relates to follow-up, because I guarantee that's probably, if you were to do a SWOT analysis of your sales team, I guarantee you that one of the weaknesses is probably gonna be follow-up. So number one, know your job. If you're a sales professional, follow-up is your job. If you're a bartender, your job's making drinks. If you're a sales professional, your job is following up and responding to inbound marketing generated inquiries. It starts with a mindset, right? The second one is you gotta understand that follow-up is a contact sport. If you can't make contact, you lose, sport. And it's, I, I shared those stats with you, half the salespeople are, are gonna quit at one, and you go all the way down, less than 6% of you are gonna reach out to me three or four more times, and the reality of it is, I've got other things to do besides buy a golf tournament. I have other things to do besides buy a wedding. So when I inquired, it was towards the top of my to-do list, and it slowly moved down towards the bottom because I've got a life, I've got a job, I've got kids, I've got commitments, I've got all these other things. It's your job to bring it back to the surface. So I get asked this question, how, how many times should I touch a customer before I quit, before I quit, before I give up? How many times should I reach out to them? And my answer is always, well, never, never quit. Here's the drill. If, so, if you put out a proposal for a tournament, an event, banquet, or a wedding, there's only three responses you can get, right? Yes, I want it. No, I'm gonna go somewhere else. And, and I can live with both of those. One of my competitors uh, teaches get to the no. Because if, I can't sell to me, but if I throw, if the, I reach out to them, I follow up one time, I call those guys one hit wonders. They hit the, the prospect one time and then they wonder where the business went. So. Never quit, but the reality of it is, is I would encourage your salespeople, if you've got an inquiry and it's in, at, stuck at maybe, and I can't sell to maybe, five, the number's five, over maybe a 10 day business period. And that those touches are uh, phone calls, voicemail messages, and by the way, voice, you know I know, anybody ever leave a voicemail, a salesperson leave a voicemail for somebody and you, they never call you back? You know why they don't call you back? Because your voicemail sucked. You tried to sell over the phone, you were vague, you didn't plan it, you prattled on. I, I mean, we live in a digital world. You know what I like about my iPhone? Visual voicemail. So I can look and I can see five or six messages and I get this one that's two minutes long. I'm not listening to that. There's no way. You got like 25 seconds to leave a voicemail message for somebody. And the only reason to leave somebody a voicemail in the sales cycle is to get them to call you back. Same thing with email. So you've got phone calls, voicemail, email, um, Heaven forbid you write a hand, write a proposal for a $25,000 wedding and they walk out and they're like, well, we need to go home and think about it. Spend five minutes and write them a handwritten thank you note. Drop it in the mail. That's a touch. Your job as a sales professional is to get it to bubble back to the service. And then this last one, well, actually I share two more with you. Um, the third strategy or tactic around follow-up is this. No schedule, no commitment. So how many of you manage salespeople? You have a salesperson that reports to you? Ask them this question, say, let me show me on your schedule, show me on your calendar where you do your follow-up. Because if it's not on your schedule, you're not committed to do it. You know, we have to go to a dentist appointment, we put that on our calendar, we don't miss those. We got a soccer game that our kid's playing in, we put it on our schedule, we don't miss those. Ask your salespeople where follow-up is on their calendar. And if it's not, they need to put it on there. No schedule, no commitment. So there's only two reasons that it's not getting done, because they won't or they can't. So get it on the calendar, block small pieces of time out for that. And then this last one, uh, what's your follow-up mantra? What's that thing that you're gonna share with your prospective customers or buyers that says who you are as it relates to follow-up? And here's what I mean by that. For me, I travel a lot, I'm in and out of planes, trains, and automobiles, and I get a lot of inbound emails, I get a lot of inbound phone calls, as many of you do, but I have a mantra, and I share with people, and I'll share it with you right now. You'll get my contact information. If you want questions, you got questions you want me to answer, call my cell phone, leave me a voicemail. Shoot me an email, here's my follow-up mantra. You leave me a voicemail message, or you send me an email, I will respond within 24 hours or by the end of the next business day, whichever comes first. That's my mantra, right? So what's yours, what's your salesperson's mantra? Please leave a message after the tone and I'll call you back at my earliest convenience. Nobody wants to buy that. Um, the GM at Angel Park, uh, David Bo, great guy. I had a, he's one of my clients. We had a, a really interesting conversation about follow-up, and he said, I hate that. I'll call you back as soon as I can. So he changed it. His mantra when you leave him a voicemail, he's not even a sales guy. 
But you leave him a voicemail, and here's what he says. Hi, thank you for calling. You've reached the voicemail of David Boak. I'm not able to take the call right now. It is important to me. Sound familiar so far? Here's where he changed it. He says, I will return your call as soon as I retrieve your message. I'll return your call as soon as I retrieve your message. It's a subtle difference, but that's his mantra. And when you make a public commitment, you're far more likely to follow up with the public commitment. So for those of you who are in sales, come up with your mantra. For those of you who manage salespeople, find out what theirs is. Help, call them and pretend to be a buyer and see how long it takes them to get back to you. Because that's where the money is at. So I'll just close my section by, by just a couple of things. Don't let your head hit the pillow tonight until you've captured that one, at least one or two, but no more than three things that you're going to do as a result of what you've heard from all these experts, because that's how we get paid, right? So what's that one or two or three things that you're going to do in your business to drive sales, to build your brand? And then my question would be, how are you going to communicate that message to your staff to make sure that they're all on the same friggin' page? Because if they're not, you're just wasting their time. Thank you. Hammer. Love it. I'm motivated. I'm motivated. And I I got. I already tweeted or posted on my Facebook page four things you said. I hashtag myself. We're gonna skip through some of the slides. Uh, Chris Loman with Saint Street. Why don't you give us a little brief presentation that you were gonna talk about? All right. I'm gonna try to talk just as passionate as the last. Probably what happened. All right. So. Whether you embrace social media or not, whether you have a website that you, you put a significant investment in, all businesses nowadays are online. And it's important that you establish a foundation for success. And what I've done is I've, probably should. There we go. I've uh, distilled this down to five do's and five don'ts. So how to get the most out of online, online engagement. Number one, steal everything. Just absolutely raid the cover. What, what, this, what this specifically entails is do competitor research. Look at your core competitor set, look at other categories that are near to your specific category, and then look at uh, case studies and best practices that you can find on websites like Mashable, TechCrunch, you know, and other trade-specific websites, right? Number two, do it. If you're going to, if you're gonna set the goal of being successful online, put effort forward. Don't just dabble in it. You've gotta invest time and resources and money. And as we just heard, time is money. So be, be aggressive and be smart. Number three, make mistakes. Make mistakes, it's okay. You know, social media, your website, these are all sounding boards. Surveys, they're sounding boards. Make mistakes, listen to your customers, listen to your partners, and just, when appropriate, go down a different path. You've gotta test new channels. You know, Eric mentioned <coughs> WhatsApp earlier, which is the, the, the technology that Facebook just acquired for a gazillion dollars. You know, their technology is different than Facebook, is different than Instagram, is different than, you know, it's different than Pinterest, but what they are is something new, and it may be something that's gonna migrate over to the United States, and it may be something that we're gonna need to try. I promise you, WhatsApp is going to be in the United States prevalent the next year and a half. Stay awake, right? This is key whether you're B to B, B to C, B to whatever, stay awake. Pay attention to what people are saying about you, your personal brand, and your company's brand online. That doesn't mean that you always have to engage, but you sure as heck better listen. And you better catalog it, you better discuss it with your senior management, you better think long and hard about what people are saying, whether it's Yelp, greenskeeper.org, whether it's a review on Amazon, whatever it is, pay attention to it. And maybe react to it, hopefully in a positive way. So the fifth point is be social. So now you've been listening to it, you've been You've been hearing your customers. Some have been saying some nice things, some have been saying some bad things. But you have to engage, right? In the world of social media, you can't just sit back and hear it, right? You've got to jump back into the conversation and address those people who are upset. You've got to thank those people who are happy. And 
it's you know proof to the pudding. If you can turn an adversary into an advocate, they are going to be more apt to say something nice to you, and certainly they have a bigger voice. Who here right now is going to think twice about booking a resort stay at the Ritz Carlton? Not anymore. Yeah. Well, not anymore. And if you think that social media just takes place online, who here just heard how bad the Ritz Carlton is in New Orleans? <laughs> We've all been part of social media since the day we were born. Don't. Don't get pissed. Don't get pissed. Yeah. Right. Quite simply, when you are listening to conversations that are online, you're going to hear things you don't like. Take a deep breath. A deep, deep breath and address it in an appropriate manner. That doesn't mean that you can't be strong in your belief and, or stand up for your brand or stand up for your customers. But I'm not saying that. But just don't fuel the fire. But also, don't just let the fire burn. Now, there is no perfect science to when you address what I refer to as the crazies. There's no perfect science to when you let them ramble on, but certainly you need to pay attention and not get too hot-headed. All right, number two, stop learning. This kind of maps back to, you know, steal everything. Don't stop learning. There are trade publications. There are sessions like this. There are, you know, magazines that you can read, conversations you can have professionals that you can ask questions to. Just don't stop learning. Don't do something today and assume that it's going to be successful six weeks or six months or six years from now. All right, number three, be cheap. Again, there is a, an investment that needs to be made. More times than not, the investment to be successful online is going to be time focused. Don't be cheap. Don't assume that you can have a successful online engagement program and invest 30 minutes a day doing it, or five minutes every hour. You need to ensure that you have resources that are focused on it, that are dedicated to it, that are smart enough to be able to deliver on what your objectives are. And don't be cheap. Because if you are going to be cheap, it will come back and bite you. And I promise you, you're going to have competitors that will be investing and will leak you, and they're going to be the ones that are going to be talking about the next time you're on a panel. All right, the next two, I think, are the most important Lessons to be learned with online engagement. Number one, rely on the kids. Look, I asked earlier who was on Pinterest and three hands came up. And my brother and I both brought up WhatsApp and the only reason you've ever heard about it is because Facebook spent $18 billion to buy it. Don't rely on the kids to drive your social media. Don't rely on a coordinator. Don't rely on, don't rely on the, the new person you hired because they actually happen to be on Pinterest. Make sure that the person who's out there representing your brand and your voice online, on digital, in forums, on blogs, responding to people from TripAdvisor to Greenskeeper.org to reviews on Amazon, make sure they're qualified. I'm not saying don't put this in the hands of a 21-year-old, but that person better think like a 40-year-old who owns a business, manages a business, manages a P&L. And if you are going to put some younger staff that probably a little bit more inexperienced into that position to be able to respond, make sure that you have a crisis communication tiered structure, right? Everybody can say thank you. Everybody can communicate that there's a promotion around the corner. But when somebody does jump online and say something defamatory or you know aggressive towards your brand, make sure that they know who to go to so that they can get some advice and some coaching. And that's really, really, really important. I've worked for and with organizations that have completely screwed that up. And it has come back to bite them. The fifth item, let them loose. How many people in here have more than 10 people that work for them or underneath them? 10 people. If those 10 people represent your brand, your personal brand. They represent your professional brand and your company. If you don't have in place a social media policy, a social presence policy, then you're putting yourself at risk. 
if you work for a big company, and I'll use Steve for example, the Irvine company. The Irvine company has a social media policy in place to ensure that their employees don't go off and be dipsticks online and say something bad about their work experience or what happened to their, you know, what they didn't like a management decision. You know, they have a policy in place to protect their assets and their brand reputation. So make sure that you have a policy in place like that. And I'll share one anecdote that has to do with SwimSpot. This is a company that you know, I get paid to help drive their brand, their you know, marketing and, you know, in, a, in, a, in a very large capacity. So SwimSpot has an online direct-to-consumer retail channel, but we also have brick and mortar. And we have a location that is at the Westville Topanga, a nice mall in the valley. And we have about 10 employees that work at the Westville Topanga. And what we did, what SwimSpot executives did, we gave access to employees to be able to post to a Facebook page exciting things that were happening in the booty. You know, pictures from an event, uh, successful sales, you know, successful sales, somebody who's happy with a suit they bought or a cover up. And it was all going great right up until we fired that employee. And then that employee walked the executive team out from that Facebook page, started to post wildfire that we had absolutely no control over, even though we owned the trademark. It took us three weeks to get it back. Now that employee and a peer who was still employed and the, the mother of the peer who was still employed went to Yelp. And then they started posting the Yelp about how bad their experience was and you know how, how bad the customer service was and the product and you know how how dirty the back room was and you know they just started to degrade the brand. Now with Facebook we're able to recapture that page. We learned a lesson don't give everybody control to make sure that you set parent child relationship with managing these channels. And with Yelp we were actually able to get some of those reviews removed. But at the end of the day, if we had a better policy in place, we have never given those two employees management capabilities to be able to manage that specific Facebook channel. Thank you so much. We have a lot of slides here we're going to skip through. Hopefully this works. Maybe not. While we're here, thank you guys very much for supporting uh, the panel. We really greatly appreciate it. You guys have done a great job. We're stronger today. <laughs> uh, whoa, you look just like Tiger with that new cover. <laughs> it is long. There's, there's the old saying, don't repeat. What did that last quote say? Don't repeat your mistakes or learn from your mistakes or something? <laughs> We'll give this about five more seconds, then we're just going to say goodbye. It is a commercial for Nike Golf, which I think is kind of funny. You guys will never guess that we never did this before until today. <laughs> Uh, well, if you guys watch the Golf Channel or you watch the PGA Championship or the Ryder Cup, I'm sure this will actually play during that. But uh, again, thank you guys very much for participating today. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Yeah, their contact information is listed on something that Alex and Brianna printed out. If you have any questions, feel free to direct them to them first. They'll direct it to me. Uh, I got work to do to catch up. But thank you guys very, very much. I appreciate it.
uh, of our efforts being significantly enhanced by our very kind and generous sponsors. And we have some with us today, and I'd like Rob Keller to come forward and introduce these very nice people that make our lives so much better. Rob, please. And again, to just reiterate the sentiment, the uh, Southern California PGA, uh, we can't thank our sponsors enough. I'd almost feel remiss if I didn't do my best David Murdahl here and say how fantastic our sponsor support is. And please, please, please support our sponsors in return. But in all honesty, um, we're very thankful to have these individuals here that are about to come up and just do a short presentation for you all. And their support of you and support of our Southern California PGA professionals very, very thankful for. Um, and at this time, if I may begin here uh, from Club Car, if I could call up Mr. Eric Andrews. Mr. Andrews. Advantages to outsourcing your maintenance. 
There's uh, savings from payroll, workers' comp, and benefits. So we talked about the reduced exposure to liability. Full, util full utilization of golf carts. Parts being maintained by factory training technicians. Parts performed at optimal level every day, every round. No loss rounds. And finally, the most important one, uh, parts provide the same on the last day as they did on the first day. I don't know how many uh, deliveries I've been to, and I, I hear, uh, man, thank goodness we're getting new parts. These parts are on their last leg, and it's like maybe a three-year deal. The parts are only three years old. That's like, you know, a little over a thousand days. They shouldn't really be on their last leg after a thousand days of use. I have uh, cars on my tournament fleet of 1997, 2005. They, they all run like, uh, you know, like brand new cars because they've been properly maintained. So finally, um, just to wrap up, you know, I don't know too many businesses that can afford to lose 15% year over year. So really, it, it comes down just to a business decision. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Jeff and uh, thank you Club Cars always, uh, such strong supporters of our Southern California PGA and our PGA professionals here. Uh, next up, if I could call Mr. Mark Mejia from U.S. Foods. that never leave you don't come from the pristine beaches. They don't come from the lush jungles, soaring mountains, or great rivers, from the majestic elephants, or terraced rice fields, from the great shopping, or nightlife either. They don't come from riding on tuk-tuks in bustling cities or the upcountry serenity, from the amazing outdoor adventures or ancient culture and traditions. They don't come from the tingle of a spicy dinner or the joy of a sweet traditional dessert or the amazing spas and retreats. There's something even more magical than the spellbinding temples all this is truly amazing, but the uniqueness of Thailand is the Thainess in everything, everywhere. And this Thainess comes from the people. The way they go out of their way to make you feel welcome. Their thoughtfulness, their happiness and laughter, their genuine warmth and grace. Where people carry a smile wherever they go, not only on their faces, but also in their hearts. Proud and happy to share their amazing home with the rest of the world. Amazing Thailand. It begins with the people. Okay, 
So have you seen in the video, Thailand really begins with the people. It's absolutely known as a destination that's uh, called the land of smiles. In this country, next slide please. Oh, uh, there we go. This country um, has 67 million people and it's geographically the size of France. Um, but it's much closer than you think. It takes about the same amount of travel time to get to uh, Thailand as it does to go to Europe on the west coast. It's a night flight, you sleep part way on the way down, you land in Taiwan or another uh, mid country, get off, stretch your legs, get back on, and you're there by noon. Okay. Should I try it? I think it's better if you do. So golf groups. Golf groups are an excellent way for you to bond with your membership and create an everlasting extra value. It's also a way for you to um, increase your revenue streams. Most of these pictures are taken from the group that I took in January. It was uh, 20 executive women golfers. And um, we had a lot of fun. Here we are getting ready to go, and that's our first round of golf at Alpine in Chiang Mai. Next slide. Thailand offers many different types of experiences. Not only is it a golf mecca, it's rich in tradi um, traditional cultural experiences. Whether you're attending a cooking school or visiting a hill tribe, you're going to be surrounded by the floral and fauna and feel of the Thai people. Next slide. January, this is some more pictures of this group. We spent 10 days and 12, or excuse me, 10 nights and 12 days. We spent five nights in the north in Chiang Mai. Some of these pictures are with the Hill Tribe people. We played three rounds of golf in Chiang Mai with a cultural day. Flew down to Phuket, spent another five nights down there, played three rounds, did a beach day. And round trip, including um, all transportation and domestic flights with breakfast, only cost $1,754 per person. So Thailand is an extremely affordable destination. You're going to get a five-star experience at a three-star price. Next slide, please. Some of the other ideas for activities while you're vis visiting can be fishing on a lily pond. It can be visiting a bird sanctuary. You can go ride elephants. You can river raft. Or you can just go shopping at a traditional floating market. Next slide. If it's water sports that's your thing, it's, you have a, it's loaded with options. We've got world-class dining, diving. They've celebrated um, water festivals. That's a water festival that's, that has to do with Buddha's birthday. And it's during the hottest time of the year. People just go out and use water guns and just have a good old time all day long. Um, or they also offer ocean rock climbing. Next slide, please. But, um, if you have foodies for guests, Thailand is a sea of choices. It's all vibrant, it's fresh, it's uh, organic. The food there is just awesome. It's where um, most of the dole plantations have moved. We get a lot of our foods coming in from Thailand. Next slide. Last month, Thailand opened their 291st golf course. They're home to many tour stops, including the Asian Tour, European, and LPGA, just to name a few. So it's really worth thinking about. Is something different, it's something excited, and it's right at your fingertips. Next slide. So please remember, First Tee is a full service travel agency. We offer a whole portfolio of products, not just Thailand. But Thailand has paid for us to be here and give their message. And um, we're hoping that you will consider us for your travel needs of any sort. We love to work with the PGA and we've been a supporter for a long time. So my cards are out front. If you have any interest at all and want to learn more about this opportunity, please contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Paula, as always. Next, I'd like to introduce from Heaven Golf, Mr. Jim Sweet. Let's give Jim a second to jump back in here.
We're a brand new shoe company. Some of you have been nice enough to stop by and have explained it to you. Um, we're European based out of Austria. We've been about a year and a half, two years in Europe. We just hard launched at the recent PGA Orlando show in the United States. I soft launched in August, which is probably not the right time to soft launch in the fall. Um, the concept is based on rock and bottom as the original idea. Health and wellness aspect of walking on the golf course, the natural fluid motion, taking the pressure off the joints and putting on the muscles. I'm sure all you are familiar with sketch of shape ups. That was there the rock and bottom as most people know. The owner of this company is a man named Herman Oberschneider. He's a world class Olympic caliber skier from Austria. He owned a company before called MBT, which was the worldwide patent on the rock and bottom. He took it to the golf level. He does not play golf. He has no concept about the game. He just loves the health and wellness. It's a, you know, a frequent comes to that. He decided to take the shoe and make it into a golf shoe, the concept. The added benefit was when he sent it to some of his personal golf and friends, was because of the curvature, when you stand on in it, every person has a different balance zone. The shoe flexes <coughs> out and allows you to have find your optimal balance point pre-swing. So, Every person has a different balance point. Flat shoes have one balance point. This has multiple, no matter where you stand. The center of gravity will always shift, depending if you're on a flat line or a side hill line. So your balance point always shifts. You all know that if you're out of balance pre-swing, you don't care how good your swing is, your swing is done. You need to be in balance to start your swing. <coughs> so that's the two concepts with this. I'm outside, I have fit trials. If anyone would like to come try them on, see what they like, see what the concept is. I'd be glad to try you out with them. Uh, we do retail, just I'll throw it up there. Retail is $199. Wholesale for the pro shops, normal wholesale is $120. But I'm going down to $80 specials for this week. If you don't have to buy them today, contact me this week if you're interested in bringing them in. The individual pros, if you'd like to try them, it is $80 for you. And you can try them, buy them. That's basically the concept. Questions or anything? Good. Okay. Thank you, Jim. And we're excited to have Kevin Golf and uh, on board for this year, and I uh, appreciate you being here. Next up from Matrix Shafts, Mr. Brian Yu. Thank you. 
Good uh, morning, everybody. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, MC and the PGA have been uh, great partners for a very long time, and we've developed a turnkey program for each individual course, uh, which benefits the course itself uh, from a financial standpoint and also all the pros on the side. So I'll just give you a couple of quick highlights on it. Um, for the Golf Retirement Plus program, uh, Pepsi will contribute on a per case basis, uh, and if you'd like more detail on that, I'll be outside until about 2 o'clock, so we can talk about that. And then also, uh, in regards to the product itself, uh, on, on any fountain package that you purchase from Pepsi, there's a $2 rebate in any 24-pack uh, bottle or can product that you purchase from Pepsi. There's also a $0.75 cent can rebate, which goes directly back to the course. So if you're interested in pricing, if, you're interested, if you have any questions regarding the, the retirement plan program, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my business cards are up front. I will be acting as a liaison between uh, Southern California, PGA, and Pepsi. So feel free to start by talking if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And unfortunately, the team from Ultimate Payment Solutions was unable to be here, but uh, we want to thank them as well for their support of Gibbs and, our, again, our Southern California PJ professionals and all of our programming. Uh, thank you very much to our sponsors. Thanks, Rob, and thanks to all our wonderful sponsors for making things better for all of us. And, uh, before we break for lunch and I introduce uh, Pete Bavakwa, uh, we want to take just a moment to celebrate uh, a very important occasion. And to do so, I ask Tom Addis to come forward, please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this will just take a minute, unless Christine speaks, then we all know. That. <laughs> nerves, she said. Uh, I'm not going to give her the microphone, but uh, uh, this is uh, something that we do on a, on a, well, I, I'd like to say on a regular basis, but not too often do we have a 10-year celebration uh, with our uh, section uh, and a, a great staff person. And you all have met Christy at least uh, on the telephone. Uh, we have the rest of our staff in the back who have been working with you, and, and we appreciate uh, their hard work uh, for uh, all of our PJ Golf professional Junior Golf, uh, and our sponsors, and everyone within our section. So thank you very much for what y'all do back there. Thanks. <laughs> we do celebrate two things today. We celebrate Christine's 10th anniversary with us. Uh, it is also March 17th, and it's her <coughs> birthday. And uh, we will not disclose the uh, numbers related to that. Uh, but Mr. Johnson, our president, has a presentation for Christine. I do indeed. I have a presentation. It's this beautiful item in this beautiful box that you can't see so well. But I can tell you, she is the voice of the section, a delight to be around, and congratulations on a decade worth of service.